Welcome to this afternoon session on the Committee for Finance. Uh, no apologies have been received. Still the case? That's right. Okay. And there's been no delegation of authority? No. Nope. Yep. Okay. A declaration of interest. Any declaration, any relevant financial or other interest at each committee meeting is applicable. Any members, any relevant issues to declare? No. Nope. There's no chairperson's business. Draft minutes of proceedings. The draft minutes of the Finance Committee meeting of the 1st of December are at page 7. Are we content with the draft minutes or an accurate record of proceedings of this? Are we agreed? Agreed. There are no matters arising. This is agreed. Agreed. And if we move on to the. Hello, Matthew. Come on in. Uh, if we move on to the next item of the agenda, uh, item number six, the defamation bill, committee stage oral evidence from the National Union of Journalists. Stephen, can you bring Professor Chris Faust into the spotlight, please? I think he's there. Chris, can you hear us? Just wave. I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. How, how, how are things in Liverpool? <laughs> I'm in Manchester, so. All oh, right. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. I'll not say anything. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so, our team, the committee will now receive oral evidence from the National Union of Journalists on the defamation bill. The session will be reported by Hansard. Professor Frost has kindly agreed to step in for the scheduled witness, Seamus Dooley, who is unwell, and we'll pass on our reg regards to Seamus um, as well. Um, the relevant papers are as follows: uh, Clark's briefing note, at page 16. Written submission from the NUJ at page 22, defamation bill table at page 29, the raised defamation paper bill paper at 67, and defamation bill and AFM at page 103. Matthew, do you want to make a declaration of interest because of your role in the committee? If you just like yes, to do that for the record. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I am the chair of the all-party group on press, freedom, and media sustainability. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Sorry, Professor Frost. Do you like Professor Frost, or are you quite happy with Chris? Chris is fine. Oh, Chris, thanks. You are very welcome to the Committee for Finance. Uh, we are inviting you to speak to the NUJ submission on the committee stage for our defamation bill. Uh, I would just like you to about 10 minutes or so telling us what you think about the bill, what you like or dislike about it, and how you might want to see it amended. And then we're going to sort of uh, we'll ask a couple of sort of uh, key questions. We've already received quite a, quite a lot of evidence so far on the defamation bill. So some of the questions might sound a bit technical from your from Ren, but we have received some information, and we're looking for some more sort of pieces of clarity to that. But please, over to you. Thanks very much, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to present our, our views to you. The NUJ uh, represents journalists in, in the UK and, of course, in Northern Ireland um, and in the rest of continental Europe. Um, we have a number of members, so we, we span across uh, a fair brief. Our general view is to support the bill, just as we largely supported the um, act on, on which it's based, which applies to England and Wales. Um, we, we do believe clearly uh, in freedom of expression. It's extremely important uh, to journalists. It's a, a central part of what we do um, day to day. But we also understand the importance of protecting uh, the right of reputation uh, of individuals. And uh, therefore, there needs to be a, a fine balance between those two rights, the right to inform the public and freedom of expression, and on the other hand, uh, the right to reputation. Unfortunately, we don't believe that the present Act in Northern Ireland uh, does that, in that it has, to, to our view, a number of flaws, many of which were corrected uh, in, in England and Wales um, with the 2013 Act, uh, and in this year, indeed, in Scotland, with, with, with the Scottish defamation and malicious um, um, uh, uh, occurrences in Scotland. So the existing act, we believe, is particularly weak in allowing that right to free speech. It, it, it allows those who have a lot of money to bully uh, journalists, to bully newspapers and others by bringing uh, vexatious uh, claims for defamation. And if we, if we look back in the past, Robert Maxwell was particularly well known for that, uh, and a large number of defamation actions died when, when he did um, some time ago. But he is not the only person to have used his money to set up um, defamation claims, which uh, people have then found difficult uh, to act against. Changing, uh, as the present bill intends to do, um, the idea of being able to just present any claim 
by saying, look, it needs to have a, a serious uh, element to it so that we get the serious harm requirement coming through uh, in the bill uh, allows for the courts to decide whether or not this is an appropriate case uh, to go ahead. And we think that's the right way to proceed. It doesn't prevent someone saying, I've been defamed, but it does allow the courts to say, yeah, but, but not by very much. If we move on to uh, other areas that we think are particularly important, uh, the defences um, against a claim for defamation are, are clearly particularly important. Truth is the obvious one that you'll have all already heard a fair bit about, moving away from the old justification to the idea that if something is true and we can prove that it's true, um, then that stands on its own. However, the, the points I really want to make in the next couple of minutes is about the changes that have happened in the way that we all work since 19, uh, 1955, uh, when the Northern Ireland Act was brought in. Obviously, what happened in '55 is totally different to the way we, we work now. I mean, the idea of me talking to you by video would not have been possible in '55, And the World Wide Web computer technology has completely dominated now the way that we work and that needs to be applied to, to any defamation. So that gives us particular concerns about the single publication rule. Uh, that needs to be changed and there have been considerable problems, uh, certainly in England, in the past, because of course, working on the web means that every time you do a new uh, look at the web page, it's a new publication. Uh, and that clearly needs to be changed and has been changed uh, in England and Wales and is in the process of being changed in Scotland. Other things that come up uh, from the web is that the way the web operates, the, the way that um, people are able to comment on stories uh, and share those, which brings additional uh, problems of potential defamation in, uh, and therefore that needs to be changed as well. Finally, we're talking about the problem that we, we faced very heavily in England when London became the libel tourism capital of the world, that people were able to sue in London for something that appeared on the internet, even if it really didn't have very much of a connection with the UK, simply because people in the UK were able to read that on the web. And we actually found this, as, in my view, appalling situation of finding some of the US <clears throat> states for introducing uh, laws uh, in their, their own states saying that our law of defamation could not apply in their country. How embarrassing, uh, to my mind, is that? And that needed to be changed, and, and the new act does that, and the bill that's being proposed here does that for Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. I think otherwise you're going to risk finding that Northern Ireland will become, uh, indeed some might say that it's already becoming, the, the libel capital of the world. And that is not, in, in my view, something that uh, any forward-looking um, province country uh, would want hanging around its neck. So those are the key elements that concern us. There aren't really any significant problems for us um, with the defamation bill as it's proposed. Uh, I mean, had we written that, it might have been slightly different. There may have been one or two minor things that we would seek. But so far, the um, Defamation 2013 Act in, the, in uh, England and Wales ha has worked fairly well. There's been fair, fair, uh, very little controversy about the way that it's operated. None of the new elements seem to have drawn any serious problems. And the number of libel cases has dropped um, slightly, but not to the extent that people are complaining that they're not able to bring claims forward when those are justified. So we would like the Assembly to support this bill uh, and enact it as soon as possible. That's it, Chair. I'm very happy to answer any questions that anybody has. We'll try okay. to anyway. <laughs> OK, thanks, Chris. And thanks very much indeed for that. Um, so just two points. The first one is that some uh, respondents to the committee stage I've always suggested that Clause 1, which is the serious harm piece, should be strengthened in order to incorporate a provision to enable parties to apply to the court in an early stage to have the action struck out if it established that it is without merit and merely sort of like strategic litigation to censor free speech, you know, like what they would do against NGOs. However, within Northern Ireland, the rules of court and common law already include provisions to allow claims without merit to be struck down. 
Why do you think other provisions are necessary, and what, could you, what would they look like? Well, I'm afraid that's a technical question that's a little bit beyond my uh, experience. My, my knowledge of Northern Ireland law is uh, more limited than perhaps it ought to be. I certainly think there needs to be some way of striking out a case very early on. It can be extremely expensive, even at an early stage, to defend uh, a claim for defamation. Uh, and that can have a seriously chilling effect on journalists who, who maybe uh, go for a story but become very concerned that it will involve massive expense before we actually get anything. But if you're telling me that the law already allows for cases like that to be struck out at a very early stage, um, then provided that's a possibility, I, I would not be too concerned about precisely how that's done. Okay. Um, the second point is, and you just touched on it there, was the question about the chilling effect. Uh, we have had evidence in front of the committee, I think it was from the senior representative from the BBC, said that 20 per cent of all its um, legal activity, litigation, etc., is around Northern Ireland, bearing in mind something the size of the BBC is a global corporation. So obviously there is a form of chill factor that is there. However, do you sense that the way the law has changed now in England and Wales, there has been any sort of diminution, diminution of a chilling effect, or in some way has it had no real effect whatsoever, or has in fact has it made, um, you know, has it improved sort of the way that sort of the media feel as if it's, it's able to defend itself? I mean, it's a good and important question. Um, but it is the kind of thing that takes quite some time to sort of drift through as the law changes. It's only been seriously in operation since uh, 2014, 2015 uh, in reality. Uh, and so for that to start to affect the, the way Germans feel about their risks when they're looking at the story, it's probably still a little bit too early. However, the, 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 there is evidence that the number of cases being brought has dropped significantly. And one of the problems about the chilling effect was always that key people, people largely rich people um, who were involved in well, various activities, would be the ones that, that do that. And we would need to see an increase in the investigations into people of that sort as journalists started to worry less about cases of defamation being brought to be able to identify whether there is any significant change. Uh, but I'm confident that will come. It just would be difficult to evidence uh, at the moment and say, oh, there's been a 20% increase in, in the number of stories uh, about certain types of people. Mm -hmm. There are other factors involved. But it certainly acted as a chilling effect against people who were well known to launch into uh, defamation actions before the new act come in, has come in. And that has made it more difficult for them since. OK, thanks very much, Steve. Take Jim first, because he needs the word. Uh, Jim? Jim, to use your sorry, <clears throat> to use your to use your own words, Chris. Your starting point seems to be that it's okay to defame a citizen, provided you don't do it very much. Well, that's certainly not what I'm suggesting. If you defame well, a citizen, sorry, the words you used is not by very much. Well, OK, then I apologise for my, my use of words that can be misinterpreted. Um, but what we're talking about here is serious harm. And the defences that are now involved um, make it much clearer about what is expected of journalists. That is truth or, or honest opinion uh, or, or privilege and, and the other defences. So Before, you, can, you can print a small lie. Is that right? Well, hardly. If you're aiming to print the truth, then you don't print lies, do you? Yes, but but if the contention is that no one has a cause of action unless they can show serious harm, the corollary mm -hmm. of that is you have no cause of action for mere harm. You have to show serious harm. So a mistruth, a distortion, provided it doesn't cause you serious harm, is okay provided you're not defamed, in your words, by very much. But, but so why, would I, why, would I want to print a, why would I want to print a small lie? I, I don't understand why... What, well, what well you, obviously, you obviously want to have no cause of action for someone about whom such a lie is printed 
if it doesn't cause them serious harm. The whole idea of Clause 1 is to prohibit actions where there is not more than serious harm. So mm -hmm. that means that that which doesn't cause serious harm is OK. And if that's a small lie, so be it. Well, I think you're rather stretching the facts there. There's no reason to suppose that it would mean that there's a whole string of, of small lies. What, what would be the point of printing small lies? The difficulty with defamation and the difficulty with both prosecuting and defending it is that you have to be able to prove pretty much everything that's there. Now, often when you prove... Oh, the shocking. Thing, you have to prove it's not always right. necessarily easy to be able to prove all the tiny little lies um, that may be or, or, or untruths that may be on or truths that are, that are underpinning it. But if you can prove the big truth, you can defend the libel. But if the defendant can prove that there's a harm, then it's up to the courts to decide how serious th that is and whether that's important. And of course, the journalists yes. will have decided that themselves beforehand. Yes. If they're lying, if they're deliberately distorting the truth, then that's a big lie. My view. Yes. But under our law as it presently stands, you have to prove the gist of the libel. No, that's not no, entirely true, nice is it? You have to justify it. That's not the same thing at all. There was an old saying that the, no, bigger, sorry, the, the, bit the bigger the truth, the, the bigger the, the, uh, the libel. No, sorry, you misunderstand me. The plaintiff has to show what the gist of the libel is and that the gist of the libel has lowered their reputation. Now, you are trying to contend that that's not enough, that you have to show that the gist of the libel not only harmed their reputation, but caused them serious harm. Yes. So you are giving immunity but, but, to but, that but which to only court causes court harm. But, but it's up to the courts to decide whether or not it's a serious harm. It's not up to the journalists. And is, is, isn't that where the level of damages comes in? If it's only a trivial matter, then won't you get trivial <laughs> damages? Indeed, in our system, but the damages and trivial, trivial matter will never get to the high court. It'll be in the county court, or if it's only a trivial matter which is brought in the high court, the defendant can have it remitted to the county court. So there already is a protection against the trivial. Well, not not within the law of defamation as you have at the moment. I mean, the, the whole point about it is that there is no way to strike it out until it gets to court the serious harm allows that to happen. Yes, by, by virtue of giving immunity to that which isn't serious harm. But talking about stretching the facts, you told us that Northern Ireland's already on its way to being the libel capital of the world. Where's your evidence for that? Well, examples of things that, that people have told me, people who, who work particularly in, in the field of libel, um, and, and the, the suggestion that, that is around that, that that's what's happening now. It, it is small at the moment, but you, you run that risk because the law at the moment um, in Northern Ireland is considerably behind the law in, in most European and, and US well, countries. Well, I, don't, I don't know, Chris, to whom you've been talking, but I can tell you this, that since 2013, on average, there have been less libel actions, less libel writs issued in Northern Ireland than there were in the years pre-2013, which strongly confines the suggestion that we in some way have become an object of libel tourism. The number of cases are falling, not rising. So whoever told you that uh, we have become a libel capital, I think, has grossly misled you. The evidence is not there to support that. Well, I said it runs the risk of it, but you also have to remember the cases of defamation in England and Wales have also fallen dramatically over, over the same period. So it may just be that people are, are no longer bringing cases. Um, I don't know. Tell You'd me this. To talk to Why the people you... who bring defamation cases. Why do you want to make life easier for the social media companies, you representing print journalists, why do you want to let them away uh, with a what Clause 5 would let them away with, yeah. whereby one publication end off? 
They're, they're merely a platform. They're not a publisher. Why do you want to help them? Well, we help all journalists. We have journalists who are members who work in social media. We have uh, members who, who work on websites of various sorts. Uh, we're not just for print journalists. Um, that, if you like, is our historic base. And we certainly recruit and, and represent print journalists, but we represent all journalists. So we represent those who, who work in those fields as well. But we're not particularly supporting so that. You don't think that supporting Twitter... the right to free expression, and if that involves those on social media, then, then so be it. But the rules apply to them exactly the same as they would do to any other journalist. No, no, you're you're trying to diminish it under Clause Five. You're trying to remove them from the category of publisher and make them a mere platform. You're making life easier for the big social media companies, are you not? Well, the, the difficulty we're saying that they, they would not be, uh, that they would be a publisher means that we draw everybody into publication. One of the important areas that newspapers uh, and broadcasters and, and others do is, is provide a platform for free debate. But if uh, a publisher, be the social media or traditional media, find that they are responsible for every single thing that gets published under that platform, there are enormous difficulties, and that's, that really will seriously reduce uh, freedom of expression. Well, maybe they'd be more careful, but of course the repeat publication is reflected in a reducing quantum of damages. Is that not correct? Not particularly. The repeat publication is something entirely different. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Jim. Matthew? Thank you very much. Thanks for your evidence, Chris. Can I um, ask about the obviously this bill basically um, uh, brings over or updates Northern Ireland law to be in line in in large part with what the Defamation Act 2013 did? Um, has there been a marked improvement in terms from the NUJ's perspective in terms of the um, stress on journalists around sort of? Um, defamation threats, vexatious or otherwise, as a result of the 2013 Act? Yeah, there certainly seems to have been an improvement, and there have been some cases where uh, previously they would have been extremely damaging to, to the, the journalist involved. Um, I, I haven't got cases handy. If anybody needs that, I would need to research those out and come back to you. But uh, the general view seems to be that things have improved a little, that it is much easier to do the work and to do it properly, the defences that, that are there now are, are legitimate, but that the protections still exist uh, for someone's right to reputation. So um, certainly that th there wasn't the kind of controversy that, that surrounded the, the old Act in England and Wales. Are you able to say if, um, from the NUJ's perspective, uh, and, and tell me if, this is, if you don't have this information, I know you're, as we're filling in for Seamus, but um, uh, one of the things that um, journalists have had to deal with, particularly in the last decade or two, has been um, uh, insecurity of work and also low pay. Um, obviously, one of the things about that is uh, alleged, anyway, about our defamation laws here is that they require particularly small uh, media companies, publishers, to, um, to be more cautious and conservative and also to have, uh, you know, they have the insurance for, for uh, actions taken against them. Is there any evidence that um, the that our defamation laws have contributed to some of the sort of insecurity of work, low pay uh, that journalists ha have experienced? You know, given that it is uh, one of the financial risks that publishers have to deal with uh, in an age of obviously declining revenues and declining circulation. I think it would be difficult to suggest that that's been directly or even indirectly responsible for the reduction in jobs and the, the lowering of, of pay and conditions uh, in, in most publishers. Um, there's certainly some um, feeling that, that uh, both in England and in Northern Ireland, publishers are still very concerned to, to, to carry certain types of uh, story because of the risks uh, of facing very heavy um, costs. Um, defamation costs are not so much about the level of damages that are presented, but the huge costs of, of paying for the legal fees of, of both sides if you lose. 
and uh, very few um, organisations now are prepared to, to carry that. More and more newspapers in particular, but, but other types of journalism, um, employ freelancers and they're not necessarily um, supporting those and it's not unknown for um, those who are seeking defamation actions to, to um, sue the journalist rather than the publisher. Um, so the, there are difficulties, but, but I, I don't honestly think I could say that uh, it's damaged job opportunities or anything. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. And then I, sorry, Matthew, just can I just one quick one there? Sir, Chris, has there been any indication since the 2013 Act came in that legal insurance premiums f have gone down? for uh, sort of media companies or if the premium still continued going upwards because I mean the, the contention is that because of the 2013 Act it is you know it's less likely for defamation actions to be um, sort of taken, taken uh, forward to that degree but it's been and it's always been quoted to us that you know it's the one of the chilling factors is the cost of legal risk and legal uh, the rest of it but has there been indication that the sort of the premium costs have actually gone down, or has the has it remained remained the same? Well, it's an interesting point. It's not one I'm I'm up on. I'm afraid I would need to make inquiries and find out what what is being charged. But I, I would certainly expect that to be the case because the the risk of a case coming forward now is is slightly less, and and the cost of that case should be slightly less as well. So it ought to be cheaper. But 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 I don't know. Chris, is there any way? Is any way through the? Is, is, is incredibly expensive and difficult to get. Is there any way through the NUJ or through any of your links you could uh, sort of inform the committee of that? So we, it would be a useful thing for us to be aware of because it would be a, a form of evidential base that it would show that there is a direction of travel caused by the change in legislation. Yeah, sure. I'll make inquiries and uh, come back to the, the committee in due course. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry Matthew. Sorry. Questions, sorry. Apologies. Um, uh, my uh, final question was around. Um, so one of the points Jim Alster put to you was that the lower number of cases, uh, I, don't, I don't know where those figures are from, but the, the a lower lower number of cases brought in Northern Ireland was evidence that uh, the defamation law wasn't more restrictive or wasn't more, you know, well, there wasn't liable tourism, but also that, you know, the, the, the defamation laws here weren't kind of tempting uh, litigiousness. Isn't it the case, or would you, and is there, and have you encountered any evidence that suggests the fact that, in a strange way, the lower number of writs issued in Northern Ireland could, in fact, be evidence that the um, that the defamation law here is more uh, penalising for uh, for media and publishers because the risks to allowing anything to proceed to court are higher. Therefore, it is uh, inevitably in their interests to one, settle proceedings before a writ is even issued, uh, and we know and have heard evidence about um, uh, about the the the, the uh, enthusiastic use of lawyers' letters to uh, to ensure damages before a writ is even drafted, and second, um, uh, the the earlier process, the even more upstream process, which is simply the editor saying to uh, his or her journalists. Uh, um, Back off that one. It's not worth it. It's not worth the cost. Is that something NUJ would um, uh, recognise? Yeah, yes, we would. I mean, I can't off the top of my head at the moment give you any cases, partly because you're quite right. It's the sort of thing that would happen where an editor would say to a journalist, no, we're not pursuing that, either because that person is well known to, to bring defamation cases. Um, you may well be quite right in everything that you're, you're saying but um, we would be sued and we just can't afford to, to go down that line. So I would certainly expect um, uh, an area of the country where uh, that the old law still applied, that it would not be unexpected that there would be fewer investigations uh, because there would be a much bigger risk of, of defamation and cases it, following. And isn't it also true, Chris, that in a strange way, the, the fact, it's one of the challenges is the fact that we clearly cannot, by definition, gather data on non and on judicial on proceedings that are not judicial and there, there's there's no official record of them because they involve a phone call uh, and a meeting uh between a a, a, a libel lawyer and a and a publisher's lawyer um uh and possibly the editor of a title but isn't it also the case that in terms of 
you know, the, the effect of, even before, the effect of the, the kind of chilling effect on ed, sort of editorial journalistic conversations is such that um, if that is happening, we might not be hearing it because for fairly obvious reasons of professional respectability, editors are not likely to put their hand up and say, uh, I'm stopping my journalists doing stories because I'm worried about the financial cost. People don't, even if that's true, there's not many editors who'd be uh, keen to admit it publicly. I you're absolutely right. I mean, I would think would hardly any editors that would be prepared to, to admit to that. Apart from anything else, if they were going to admit to that, they would have to say who they were, you know, who the story had been about, which might lead them into defamation problems anyway. So, yes, it's not the kind of area where it's very, very easy to, to get research material to find out how many such cases there might be simply because as a matter of professional embarrassment, people wouldn't want to talk about it. But it, it's certainly not unknown. And I, I've known of some cases in my, my own career, um, admittedly going back, but, but still whilst, whilst the, the, the law um, before 2013 applied. Uh, yeah, you just may not know that some of these cases are happening. Or what you might need to look out for is a rise in the number of apologies. But, but again, it's much more likely that it simply wouldn't get that far. OK, thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Pat? Thanks, Chair, and thank you. Best for your question, or for your answers there as well. Some responses have suggested that in Clause 1, I know you probably touched on it with, with the other questions that have gone around. Um, and the serious harm should be further strengthened in order to include provisions. Um, what I'm trying to get at, there was a, we had a lawyer here, a defamation lawyer, uh, and he sort of stated that he really doesn't want any work within this jurisdiction of Northern Ireland. Yet in your opening remarks, you said, I know you brought it up there earlier, about, um, about this becoming a capital uh, for litigation in Northern Ireland. Um, can you just expand on that for me? Because I have one, the lawyer saying no, yeah. you know, and then eight yourself years. saying yes. Yeah. And it's been eight years since the bill came through. That's, that's right, yeah. yeah. It's eight years. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't obviously comment for, for, for the lawyer who's saying that um, he or she wouldn't take up such a case. Um, but, but we do know that one of the problems, again, particularly about the internet, is that it makes it much more possible to choose um, a jurisdiction where, where you're going to um, sue be, because of the possibility that people might be reading stories in that jurisdiction, even if the stories were not specifically um, aimed at that uh, story. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, in the old days, if it appeared uh, in Belfast Telegraph, then it would need to be a Belfast reader who was reading it. Uh, and therefore, that's where the damage would be done. But the Belfast Telegraph, uh, or, or indeed any newspaper, is now online. And if they write about someone, then it's almost certain that someone in, in Northern Ireland will have read it. And then therefore, it is possible to bring that litigation to Northern Ireland. And it's important to, to try and prevent that happening. If the legislation in that um, uh, region or province or, or, or country is such that it becomes uh, very easy to bring a defamation case uh, and where the courts are sympathetic to that defamation case because of the way the law is structured, then some people will do that. Uh, you also mentioned the exceptions are of um, social uh, media. Uh, um, clause 5 includes significant exemptions on the liability for social mm -hmm. uh, media out um, networks. Yet you yourself and the NUJ are supporting this provision when it appears to undermine your own members, which maybe Matthew had maybe said just on a general term there. Uh, is that not, is that, I'm trying to get, why is it that you support or you, you seem to be in favour of Clause 9? And then I would have to go back to Clause 1 and the introduction of, uh, do you agree that we need the serious harm test as in Clause 1? Just for myself, I'm trying to understand where exactly it is that you're coming from on it. Well, we're coming from a position where um, the, the, the law in England and Wales is already there. This bill largely picks up um, the, the act that already exists elsewhere in the UK. 
um, and therefore picks up this area. The, the operators of websites is, is not something that we feel massively strongly about, but you have to remember that an awful lot of publishers who employ our, our members are operators of websites. And so this isn't just about the sort of Facebook and TikTok and, and, and what have you. Um, and indeed, it's arguable whether they're publishers uh, in, in any case. Um, so operators of websites are being allowed to, to carry material. So as I've said before, the comments pages on um, traditional newspapers on the web allow for um, discussion and debate, and it's something that, that newspapers want as a matter of freedom of expression. But the cost of moderation would be incredibly expensive. And, and if we don't get that freedom to do that um, with the provisos that are included in the, in the Act, then we would have to stop carrying all those comments pages, uh, or at least that's the risk, uh, and we feel that would be detrimental to freedom of expression. Okay, thanks, Joe. Thanks, Matt. Keith? Okay, thank you, Chris. Appreciate your information so far, Chris. Just a wee bit of background information on the NUJ. How many members have you got in the UK in total, and how many have you got here, roughly? Or maybe you know the exact figure. <laughs> well, we've roughly um, slightly under 30,000 members in total. Um, a significant number of them uh, are in Ireland, about 2,500, but I'm not entirely sure precisely how many are in Northern Ireland rather than the Republic. Uh, and what was there? Obviously, there's a charge. If I was a journalist, there's a charge to be part of your union, I assume? Yeah, we okay. charge fees. Um, you see your professional principles I'm looking at here. There's 12 of them, Chris. How often are they mm -hmm. updated or reviewed? Well, they're reviewed by our annual conference. Uh, mem any member can go to a branch meeting and discuss a particular part of the clause and then put a motion through to uh, our delegate meeting, uh, which happens every two years now. And uh, those can be discussed and, and changes uh, agreed and formalised and then brought back to the next delegate meeting. The last change we made, uh, I think now is, we, we, we did a complete re update in 2007 and then we, we added a clause and we strengthened the clause on children uh, from memory in 2012 I think it was. So if, if one of your members breaks one of those on their principles what happens? Mm -hmm. Well a complaint can be brought against them and then that comes before our ethics council which I chair and uh, a complaint uh, can, will be heard um, we then pass the decision of the council onto the National Executive Council, and the National Executive Council uh, can punish a member if they if they are found guilty of breaching the code, um, and that can be uh, expulsion from the union, a reprimand, or, or a fine of up to a thousand pounds. The so, member, of course, has the right to appeal to our appeals tribunal uh, if they feel they've been uh, found uh, unfairly in breach. So how many complaints have you got from Northern Ireland and how many expulsions, how many fines? And I appreciate I'm looking at a lot of data. So just to get a yeah. flavour, you know, many people have reported misconduct, we'll call it, or not breaking the principles. And where has that went from here? Uh, I'm not aware of a complaint coming f uh, with regard to an I a Northern Ireland member. Well, I can't remember how far back it would be, so no. So, so if you look at some of your principles, you're saying no journalist in Northern Ireland has been inaccurate? Oh, well, I wouldn't go that far. I'm not that stupid. Um, well, I'm going, I'm, going to but, quote, I'm going to quote, and I don't know if, if we had a witness last week, and I'm not sure if he or she is your member or not, but they quoted in black and white, I hold no be a brief for liars, but if lies are not causing serious harm, should we not prioritise free speech? That would break one of your principles, would it not? Well, it certainly would, and we certainly wouldn't support that view. Um, it, it, it's quite clear that we would want people to tell the truth. That's, that's our major part of our principle. So if we had a complaint about a member that, that suggested that they um, had written something knowing it to, to be false, that would breach our code. But if you look at your code number five, you obtain material by honest, straightforward and open means, with the mm -hmm. exception of investigations that are both overwhelming in the public interest. So is it OK then not to, if it's in the public interest? OK, not to what, sorry, in the public interest? Not to get your information by straightforward and open means. 
It's not always possible. I mean, certainly when one's investigating so okay, um, okay things of ACE, criminal is, nature, but that would Chris, be our, our first choice, yes. Chris, is it okay to tell ACE to get a good story? If you're investigating someone, then one of the big debates in journalism is, is it okay to pretend that you're something you're not, perhaps, um, which would involve uh, lying uh, in order to get a story? And it, it's a very big debate and it happens actually fairly rarely, I'm pleased to say, but it's something that uh, all ethical groups struggle with, whether the Independent uh -huh. Press Standards Organisation, IMPRESS, the NUJ, BBC, Ofcom, it, it, it's problematic. But to suggest that we couldn't uh, use uh, methods that were not straightforward um, leaves us always having to, to, to tell the truth about who and what we are and what we're asking for, and that may not always be sensible. Keith, one... yeah, Keith just, just, just something that's just raised a point, if you don't mind me, Keith. That obviously goes directly to Clause 1 when we're talking about the issue of serious harm mm -hmm. and what is deemed by serious harm. Because if we're saying, bearing in what the, sort of the vice chair of the committee said, that you know, you've agreed that in certain circumstances a, sort of a journalist might stretch the truth, to put it politely, to gain the story because it's part of the greater public good. If you look then at sort of the serious harm context of the proposed legislation, does that not then give a charter for widening that out? Not at all, because what we're talking about with the serious harm is what was published about the person who's claiming their reputation was damaged, not about the methods the journalists might have used um, to achieve that. Okay, right. Sorry, Keith. Okay. Just one final point. Maybe through the chair, it'll probably be, if you're content, Chris, we could maybe write some information just to get details on how many members you've here, many allegations of misconduct, call it what you want. So we're, we're, if the chair's content, yeah, sir, I'll be, I'll just write a, yeah. a wee note to you, Chris, just to get a wee bit of that detail. You know, many members you've here, except we're going to pull something together if we're content. And final yeah. point, yep. do you think it's acceptable, or, well, I'll maybe ask us a different way. Are you content with the bill as in its current format, or should it be amended? that if a journalist says something incorrect about an individual, whatever that is, that they then get a postage stamp on page six to say sorry? Because sorry, yeah. sorry in two days could have left that individual financially ruined, out of a job, marriage breakdown, whatever. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I accept days, your but... basic premise, but what, what you're talking about is moving away from the Defamation Act to the proper regulation of the press and broadcasting to uphold ethical standards. And I'm very happy to talk about that at length. My, my view of, of IPSO is, is fairly well known. And the, the way that that can be allowed to happen with, as you say, just a posted champ apology, it, it seems to me, and, and indeed my union, uh, to be appalling. But I don't see how that's linked into the Defamation Act. Uh, or the serious harm test, which which is not about whether or not there is a further apology. Okay. 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 Thanks, Chris. Well, Alicia. Good morning, good chair. I was a five-year-old, Chris. Chris, you're very welcome. Thank you, uh, Chris. <laughs> the one area that uh, we've we've covered quite extensively is this uh, whole area of serious harm. Um, how would you define it, and who do you think should be defining? serious harm and at what stage should one will say apply a definition to it well i'm quite happy for the courts to determine that as is suggested uh, within the bill uh, and as is applied with the act in uh, in england um obviously editors and, and the journalists involved in writing the story would need to consider uh, at a much earlier stage whether they felt that this was a serious harm um, and, and therefore whether they wanted to pursue the story. But from the journalist's point of view, this would be something that is accurate, something that is truthful, something that they can prove is truthful. Uh, and it's a matter of whether or not uh, it, it's serious harm or whether it's something, um, well, I, mean, I, I don't think they would be doing it if they didn't think that it, it was a serious harm. The point about the serious harm is to prevent the vexatious claims that used to dog journalists um, from certain people uh, until the, the act was brought in um, about things that were not a serious harm. They, they may still be truthful and, and often were. And this what seems to be forgotten here 
it is that a large number of rich people, because it's not cheap, were able to bring defamation claims against stories that were not a serious harm, but they knew were truthful, that they knew the journalists could support, but they knew the journalist, or, or certainly the journalist publisher, couldn't afford to defend. Yeah, well, of course, I'm coming at this from a perspective, not that I'm thinking at all in terms of uh, the rich person, but in fact, the poor man or the ordinary man on the street, uh, and that uh, when he is being defamed, that he might have uh, his own yardstick for deciding whether or not it has caused him serious harm. So what yeah. defence does he have in that situation? Well, the first uh, defence would be to go to the Independent Press Standards Organisation to bring a complaint. Uh, I've already said that I, I think that's uh, severely lacking, but uh, uh, that, that is what um, publishers have offered and that is certainly what the UK government has accepted as being uh, reasonable in that they did not pursue further um, other methods of uh, ensuring that there was proper protection for those who couldn't afford expensive defamation suits. Uh, yeah. And I agree with you, they, they need protection just as much as the rich people uh, do. Um, but the way that the law has been structured, unless you're suggesting that something else should be inserted in the Defamation Act to, to allow for, for um, some kind of legal support, uh, I don't see how this is a game poor people can play either way. Never has been. Just, no, I, I'm actually suggesting quite possibly that it might be more accessible to the man in the street uh, in its current form as opposed to uh, introducing this yardstick because just as you have already received the evidence and I know you totally disagreed with that position, like you had a not an unknown journalist <laughs> making that statement uh, to our committee that, well, you know, we white lies okay as long as it doesn't cause serious harm, you know, uh, because really at the end of the day what trumps all else is freedom of speech. Uh, I'm sure probably in America they'd find plenty of people that would agree with that position as well too. But to move on just to uh, another element of it, uh, that you mentioned yourself just um, that some of the difficulties and the problems even within the current bill that were maybe that uh, in relation to um, uh, the um, idea of single publication rule, that uh, has it been accommodated uh, in its current form? Can it be accommodated, we'll say, even within this bill? Uh, or is it a discussion as was suggested again to this committee that should happen probably at a much wider level, not just in terms of uh, uh, Northern Ireland or even Britain, but that within Europe, especially whenever you start addressing uh, this issue in relation to uh, social media companies that, if anything, they really do carry the power in a whole lot of ways with the amount of resources that they have at their disposal. Well, I mean, you're certainly right about the power in terms of, of um, finances at their disposal. The, the main point about the single publication rule is that it, it identifies when there is a first publication and that becomes the material for, for which an action could be applied um, through the courts and then go through the process that's outlined in the bill. Um, if there were a, a, another publication by another publisher of the same thing, of course, that would become another publication. And if the um, initial first publication was amended significantly, um, or even frankly at all, I suppose, it becomes a, another publication and therefore uh, opens itself up again to litigation. But the key point is that uh, it's not a publication that keeps getting repeated. And it's because the technology has changed. Um, back in 1955, when the uh, newspaper was published, uh, we would print uh, X thousand copies, however many it was, million in some cases, and each of those would be a first publication. But if that publication is repeated, if the same newspaper were published again sometime later, that becomes a different publication. But that's exactly how the web works. Each publication is a new iteration of the one that went before, even though it might be identical. And that was being used by some people to make multiple um, uh, cases against the, the original publisher. And, and that's just not acceptable in the way that the technology works. And do you feel that this act 
addresses that as well too? Yes, I think it, it gives a reasonable interpretation of, of what we're expecting and how it should work. And it does seem to, I'm not aware of any case coming up um, that, that um, proves that it's not working very well. <clears throat> but as I say, one of the, one of the problems is that the, the new act in, in England has only been in operation for about six or seven years. Some of those have been blighted by the pandemic anyway. Um, which has, as we know, slowed a lot of things down. So, so it is quite difficult to decide whether or not it's made a massive improvement. But, but, but generally, the people I talk to seem to, to think it is a better method than, than before. Okay. Okay. Well, Margaret, Chris, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, thank indeed, you. Malaysia. Thank you very much, and great. Uh, sorry. Thank you very much, indeed, Chris, for your evidence. And there is a couple of things that you said you would uh, uh, undertake to uh, get back to the committee with. But uh, thank you very much indeed for your time, and uh, I look forward to talking to you again sometime in the future. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Okay, so if we move on to the next item of the agenda, defamation bill, committee stage, and oral evidence from index and censorship and English pen. We're going to receive oral evidence from the index on censorship and English pen on the defamation bill. The session will be reported by Hansard. We've got Jessica in person, don't we? Yeah, she's just coming in. Ah, oh, brilliant. She'll speak first. And have we got Charlie Holt on Spotlight? Charlie, is that you? Can you hear us okay? It is, yes, I can. Hi. Excellent. We're just bringing Jessica in. Hi, Jessica, come on in. Hello, thanks a lot. Charlie's in Amsterdam. Is he? Charlie, are you in Amsterdam? I am indeed, yes. Sorry not to be there in person. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll do you a swap if we could. Right. Okay. <laughs> Okay, team. Jessica is representing is the policy and campaigns manager for Index on Censorship, correct? Okay. And Charlie's a UK campaigns advisor for English Pen. Uh, the relevant papers are at the briefing notes, page 140. The joint written submission from both of you is at page 146. Is that correct, Jessica? Yep. Um, I believe so. I yep. Don't okay. Have it up in front of me. And uh, and I think what I'm going to do is I think you're going to lead off Jessica. So I'm going to ask you to talk for about ten minutes, and then I'm going to ask uh, Ian to come in. And then there's a quite a few questions we'll ask as we go through. We've already received quite a bit of evidence, but you might find that the questions we'll ask will be quite technical at that point because we're we're sort of we're trying to sort of elucidate some more of our sort of our thinking at that stage. But please, over to you. Sure. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Members, for having me here. Um, Index on Censorship and English Pen have been working closely on this, on this issue for many years, and we are very glad to be here to give evidence today, as we feel this is an important issue. Um, Index on Censorship was established 50 years ago as a champion of freedom of expression around the world. Although our work extends beyond media freedom, um, that's what I'm going to mostly focus on today. Um, a few weeks ago, I asked a leading defamation lawyer in London about what publishers in England and Wales make of Northern Ireland defamation laws. Um, he said, and I quote, overall, my sense is our clients regard Northern Irish defamation law as a sort of legal wild west, very archaic, unpredictable, and if you're unlucky enough to be sued there, you risk getting bogged down in old fashioned litigation for years. Northern Ireland's defamation laws are having a chilling yes, effect. Just a quick one. Yep. Um, we've heard this quite a few. I think the committee would be interested to know, do you have any specific, specific I do. examples? I do. I have some Excellent. examples. And I'll actually get into as well why the examples Excellent. are so hard oh, to yeah. come by. Um, so Northern Ireland's defamation laws are having a chilling effect in Northern Ireland, but not only. Um, just the possibility of legal action here is in some cases enough to dissuade publication or broadcast, even if the information in question is accurate and in the public interest. And by way of example, um, in 2015, Sky Atlantic's plan to broadcast the award-winning film Going Clear about the Church of Scientology um, was shelved because of fears that the broadcaster could be exposed to libel claims in Northern Ireland from members of the church. They believe they could have broadcast... Right, Jessica, have we got some um, evidential base for that? Yeah, that, well, that's published in the Guardian. I mean, it was reported on in the Guardian at the time. It was actually put into evidence in our written evidence as well. Okay. Um, but I can follow up and send, I mean, the reporting of that as well, as I say, which was in The Guardian at the time, back, back at the time. Um, so it could have been broadcast in England and Wales without any legal consequences. But because of the lack of suitable defences in Northern Ireland, they didn't feel confident that they could broadcast it here. The broadcaster considered... Sorry, just, sorry, just for a declaration of interest, I've seen that programme. 
but I've actually seen it in Northern Ireland. Well, I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that point. So it was actually. I mean, the, before they could broadcast it here, they actually considered cutting the transmission. Sky considered cutting the transmission yeah. altogether to Northern Ireland. That was actually, uh, you know, up for debate at the time. But they figured they couldn't do that for a single broadcast. So they decided against that. Um, and the film was eventually shown. Um, throughout the UK, but 18 months later, and they kind of did it in a more subtle way. I think they released it in some fill in some um, maybe theatres in England, I, if I believe uh, first, and then they eventually decided, kind of got the confidence to to do it throughout the UK. All right, okay. So that's the first example. Then another example, um, I've actually brought the article with me as well, which you, I can, which I'm referring to here. Uh, which you might have come across before. In 2018, Geoffrey Donaldson issued legal proceedings against the media outlet Open Democracy in response to their public interest reporting. The proceedings were dragged out in Northern Ireland for two years until May 2020, when the legal, well, the legal time limit to proceed ran out. Open Democracy spent precious time and money that they could have spent on their reporting preparing for their defence. And there, there's the article, if, if anyone is interested sorry, as well. I, and the I need, sorry, I just need to stop you there. I need to make a declaration of interest here as sort of the chair of the committee. I actually know Peter Gahan fairly well in Open Democracy. Good. So mm -hmm. I don't want to sort of make it sort of it, any of the questioning. Would I imply that I'm sort of, uh, I'm sort of, I'm very familiar with Peter Gahan's but, work. But we can look, sir. We mm -hmm. can we can look at you can take a look at the article, and in the article they say specifically that, um, well, they say, for instance, if they went to court to defend our reporting, we, wis we risked bankrupting open democracy. And another area of the article they say, on press freedom, Northern Ireland is still a place apart. It's much easier to sue journalists there. So you can, if you want to take a look, there we go. Um, so as I say, um, uh, well, I was actually coming to the fact that I know a lot of people have difficulty pointing to examples. Yeah. Um, and, um, well, I've just mentioned two so far. But it is challenging for us to, to point to specific cases because it's very difficult to, for people to, you know, to encourage people and to get people to speak on the record about this because they fear that they may... You know, um, you think this is the chilling effect? Yes, exactly. It's the chilling effect, and people are really, even after the lawsuit is finished and concluded, they're still afraid to speak about it. Um, and and even by way of you, you mentioned about Peter Gagan, I spoke to Peter Gagan a few weeks ago, only two weeks ago in London, about this case as well. And they've recently found out that for publishing this article, speaking about having faced the lawsuit, their insurance has gone up threefold this year. So th this is, I mean, it's 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 the chilling effect, which is coming from you know several angles. There's a lot of reasons to discourage journalists from speaking out about this kind of legal, uh, basically legal harassment. Um, and moreover, the situation is even more difficult to monitor in Northern Ireland because of the number of cases that quietly settle here. Um, so you had Dr. Mark Hanna in a few weeks ago. Um, it, his research has shown that only 17 of 140 defamation cases issued in Northern Ireland between 2014 and 2020 resulted in a judgment. Um, in 2020, uh, one senior reporter in Northern Ireland told me that the amount paid out in settlements by his publication every year is about the same of, as his salary. Um, he said, it's probably on par with what I earn every year, so in, uh, to employ me as a journalist effectively costs double. Bear in mind that this is happening, you know, these settlements, these expensive settlements and, and um, court cases and so on, or, or lawsuits, are happening in the context of media organisations coming under increased economic pressure as traditional, uh, traditional funding models have collapsed. Um, the decreased financial resources that are at their disposal means that media outlets are more inclined to settle, even if they believe everything they've published to be completely accurate and in the public interest. Um, settling does not necessarily indicate admission of wrongdoing. Settling, retracting and apologising is very often the quickest means for publishers to get rid of a case which could end up taking years and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's often a strategic and commercial decision. So, I mean, when Lisa McHugh mentioned previously about the average, you know, the, the, the man or woman on the street, as it were, but I think if we really had the interest of the man and woman on the street at heart here, we would be, you know, looking to amend the defamation laws in order to make sure that they are they receive um, the information that they have the right that they are entitled to. Um, yeah, the, and of course, I mean, we we acknowledge at the just, same time. Just, just on that one, just a, mm -hmm. again, one of the things we've heard as well is because. No matter what you do to take a defamation case, because obviously there is no legal aid in support of it, mm -hmm. you're going to have to have substantial resource behind you to do it. 
Yeah. So, you know, whereas we talk about opening us up to, you know, making it more uh, amenable to other people to take defamation if they thought so, but increasingly it sounds as if this is this bill is specifically about sort of in journalism to allow journalists not to feel as if they have this chilling effect. So I haven't. I, my, my sort of question is really, you know, when we say that it sort of increases the sort of the democratisation, if you want to, of the, of the process to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what evidence do we have of that? Because all, all you know, I hear that it makes, uh, it reduces the chilling effect on journalism, but does it reduce the, have we any evidence to say that it reduces the chilling effect on individuals or other people who are looking to do that? Well, I mean, I'm assuming when you're talking about it, like, the the individuals that are you referring to individuals that journalists are writing about i mean i'm, I'm focusing a little bit more on on uh, on i suppose especially media outlets because those are the ones that are publishing like uh, we in terms of i know social media has come up a lot in the context of this committee but com social media only relates to section five of the defamation act that's not that's not really a huge issue um, in terms of this. That's a separate issue that's being dealt with. I, I mean, I know that the online safety uh, bill and so on was was already brought up. I think that's. I, I think we can't get. Uh, it would be a mistake to get too bogged down in social media on this. Um, I mean, we've seen, for instance, uh, in Scotland, they've sidestepped um, social media altogether. Um, so. I, I, do, I don't really want to get too much into that. I'm, I'm focusing, yes, I'm focusing more on the media. I mean, we can also talk yep. about, about academics and, and campaigners and other, uh, I suppose our focus is on public interest speech. You know, someone who's writing, you know, tweets or, or something like that, purposely defaming people, that's, that's a bit of a, a separate um, issue. Uh, you know, anonymous trolls and things like that. I don't think, I don't think we should get that uh, muddled up with, with this bill. And you've seen in our bill the, the, the or sort of the uh, Mike Nesbitt's definition of a public interest, and you're happy with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so I, I actually wanted to come to as well some of the other issues. As I mentioned, I know social media was one that um, some members of the committee are especially concerned with, um, alongside um, jury trials and also the costs. I, I know that's come up uh, as well about um, you know the, the fact that adopting this act could lead to an increase of cost so I just want to address those a little bit as well um, so firstly on jury trials um, <clears throat> I mean the involvement of the ordinary citizen in the administering of justice is important and on the surface it certainly seems logical to have their uh, their participation in cases relating to defamation law however we know that in practice it is doing more damage than good um, I want to quote from a 2013 note from the Under Secretary of State for Justice, which I think sums up um, this situation. Um, they said, <clears throat> in practice, few defamation cases actually involve juries, and a substantial majority are heard by judges alone. However, the retention of the right to a jury trial creates practical difficulties and adds significantly to the length and cost of proceedings. Uh -huh. That is because the role that juries, if used, have to play, such as in deciding the meaning of allegedly defamatory material. It means that issues that could otherwise have been decided by a judge at an early stage cannot be resolved until trial, whether or not a jury is ultimately used. That means that proceedings take longer and cost more than they should. Um, and then also, just coming on to costs, so I asked um, Rupert Sorry, Kaupel, Jessica, just a dark up A yep. few, I mean... Obviously, one of the important things about having a sort of the importance of having a jury trial mm -hmm. is it, you know, it is the best form of justice because we do have a jury there. But are you saying that you wouldn't want to see a jury trial because of the results that we've had from jury trials that haven't gone the way that have been expected? Or is it just on the basis of cost or the fact that the juries? can't understand the complex issues in defamation. What's your particular perspective on that? Yeah, I think it's primarily the latter. I mean, it's just the, the fact that, I mean, I mentioned um, the um, research done by Dr. Mark Hanna about how many settlements are done, like the really, really, excuse me, high proportion of settlements in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think, you know, the, the fact that a jury, I mean, the jury trial makes um, the, the process much more unpredictable than it otherwise could be. Um, as I say, it increased costs, it increased time, um, and it's, um, 
yeah, it's it's it's. I think it's fair to say that it is increasing the 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 chilling effect because journalists don't feel that they will um, that they will kind of get a fair hearing, I suppose, before a jury to some extent. They won't really get the. Um, Do you really want to say that? No, I know it's not the best. It's not. I didn't really use it in the same, in the right way. But you know, do you understand what I mean? They don't. The, it's the unpredictability, and very often in defamation cases, there's a huge degree of complexity as well um, that comes into it. That the juries. I mean, yeah, the juries can't really get to grips with in 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 yeah. this way. So. Um, I know Charlie is going to speak a little bit about that as well, so um, okay, maybe well, we can... Well listen, well, listen to what, well, listen to what Charlie has to say about that. Okay. Yeah, we can maybe delve into it a little bit more in the questions. I mean, I, I know it's a very complex one. I know it's an unpopular decision, but it is something that is... Or an unpopular opinion, maybe, but, um, but uh, you know, uh, going kind of beyond the superficial nature of it, it is, it is kind of an important issue, which I think is, uh, you know, in England and Wales, they don't have jury trials. You know, it's still an option, but, you know, kind of automatically there's not a, a thing of, of jury trials and it hasn't become a problem. Um, so, yeah, so getting on to costs a little bit, um, I actually asked um, a lawyer uh, um, and expert in defamation law for a London-based law firm, or PC, uh, Rupert Cowper Coles about the impact of the 2013 Act on Costs. Um, and he told me, I can't see any logical reason why adopting the, the 2013 Act would increase Northern Ireland legal costs to equal those of London lawyers. He went as far to say that any suggestion to that effect was totally irrational scaremongering. Um, he believes the introduction of the Defamation Act 2013 in England and Wales was relatively cost neutral for clients. And he said that even um, that there have been costs, uh, small costs incurred on a, or, um, costs incurred on a small number of test cases in ascertaining the legal boundaries of new defences. But if Northern Ireland were to adopt this legislation now, they would already have the benefit of the last seven years of jurisprudence, which means the scope of the of uh, of the the bill would be considerably clearer for Northern Ireland in 2022 than it was for England and Wales in 2014. Um, he actually said that he believed there would potentially be savings for Northern Ireland, as the 2013 Act is likely to prevent parties from incurring costs on fruitless litigation. Um, so just to summarise, um, uh, do, should the legislation be brought forward? Well, yes. I mean, it's not a silver bullet. We're not saying that it is. Um, it's not intended to be, but it is a first step to providing a more enabling environment, um, as I say, for media freedom, um, but therefore also for human rights, for rule of law and for democracy in Northern Ireland. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Charlie, over to you. Well, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to give evidence this afternoon. I think my accent probably makes it unavoidably clear that I'm not from Northern Ireland, but I, I hope I can provide some insight here on our experiences with the Defamation Act of 2013. Uh, as Jessica says, English Pen and, um, and Index on Censorship together launched the libel reform campaign in 2009 alongside Sense About Science. And more recently, we've been working together to counter the abusive use of defamation law against those engaged in public participation, so-called slaps that Andrew Scott, I know, made reference to in his evidence. I should start by explaining who it is that we represent and what it is that we promote. Uh, English Pen was established 100 years ago in 1921 to champion the freedom to read and the freedom to write. The acronym Pen actually stands for Poets, SAS, Novelists, though since then our scope has expanded to encompass all of those engaged in the dissemination of the written word. Uh, I start with this because I think it's important to emphasize that our focus here is not so much on, on media freedom, but, but more bro broadly with the right to freedom of expression. In particular, we're concerned with the impact that structural inequality has on free speech, since we find that the, the right to free speech tends to be particularly precarious uh, in relation to those who have very little money or little power. And I think this is particularly true in the context of defamation. Um, a lot has been said already about the lack of appetite amongst big media organizations to fight expensive defamation <laughs> lawsuits. Less has been said about the prospect of lengthy and complex proceedings on, on individual writers, freedom, uh, freelance journalists, NGOs, bloggers, or, or small newspapers. Um, Jessica already made reference to the long-term revenue decline of media organizations, and I think it would in any event, therefore, be a mistake to characterize the news industry as a sort of Goliath here. But I think it's important to emphasize as well the, the range of players involved in this debate. 
I think on that note, it's important to say that we do take into account the fact and the broader problem that defamation law isn't inaccessible to anyone but the rich. And, and I think there is some truth in this. The difference is that with defendants, this inaccessibility doesn't just impact the individual. We're talking about impacts on press freedom, on democratic accountability, on the public right to information, and, and ultimately on, on good governance. So this isn't just a, a tension between two rights we're talking about. There are systemic implications here for the way that we govern ourselves as a free society. Um, with all that in mind, I think it's worth looking at the central purpose of the Defamation Act of 2013. The draft law was described by Lord McNally, who was then Minister of Justice, as being, and I quote, a consolidation bill aimed at clarifying the law and putting it into a place where people can clearly understand it. This is not a radical law. Uh, at the same time, it would be wrong to say, as, as has been said in this committee, that it was not responding to a pressing social need. Um, we noted in our submission that in 2010, the House of Commons Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee published a report in which they described the abuse of our libel laws then as being a, quote, national humiliation. Um, Professor Frost said earlier and made reference to the UN, to, or rather to the US Speech Act, which was passed to block enforcement of laws such as ours, and which was really prompted by a number of high profile cases involving US citizens. And of course, as we also put in our report, the UN Human Rights Committee had attacked the UK's defamation law as, quote, serving to discourage critical media reporting. Despite this uh, recognized need, the draft defamation bill was subject to an exhaustive process of review when it was introduced. Uh, it commanded support from MPs from all the main political parties and was the subject of pre-legislative scrutiny, public consultation, and a careful review by a joint committee of both parliamentary houses. The final form, which we see in the Defamation Act of 2013, represents a compromise and frankly, it's a compromise that falls short of, that fell short of what, of what groups such as ours were originally calling for. But in providing greater clarity in the law, the act provided greater certainty to those who were on the receiving end of aggressive legal threats. And it therefore helped to counter the chilling effect our law was having on public interest speech. Um, our submission uh, was focused on, on five points in particular, um, but I'd like to really focus on three points here that I think are particularly important. Jessica's already discussed some of them, so I will, but I will try to, to complement and, and not duplicate what she was saying. The first thing I draw attention to is Clause 1, uh, uh, the, the harm test, which can provide a simple but crucial means of filtering out trivial or frivolous claims. I mean, I think it is important to note, as Andrew Scott did, that preliminary hearings on harm remain an exception, not a norm. Uh, that is important to bear in mind. But where harm is a central issue of dispute, an early resolution of this issue can help to efficiently dispose of a claim. And I think this goes to another issue, which we will keep going back to, which is the efficient case management, which this does help so much to help. I think a related issue here is Clause 11, um, dealing with juries, which Jessica's already spoken about. And it's important for a similar reason. Often the central issue in dispute in a claim is meaning. If meaning can be dealt with swiftly, um, such matters, uh, claims are often then settled one way or another, which is something that, that Mark Hanna explained in his evidence, I know. Um, in, without this swift resolution, such matters of fact are left to be determined by juries at the end of the litigation process. And as Mark Hanna said, what happens more often than not is you'll just have therefore settlement one way or the other, usually in a way which is disadvantageous to the defendant. Chris, can I just, uh, and, Chris, can I just yeah, please. point of something to you? I mean, the basis for a lot of this is what is deemed to be in the public interest. The jury represents the public, and deciding whether something meets the serious harm test and whether it meets the interests of public interest should obviously be a matter, in some respects, for the public to decide on that. So, and I, there seems to be, we're, we're, we've got two, two sets of arguments that seem to be running in parallel here. One is we want to streamline the process to make the process more efficient. 
And in some mm -hmm. ways, we're saying we don't want to use a, a jury from the Clause 11 from that prospect of it, because the jury is in some way doesn't have the capacity to deal with the complexities of the issue. One side of it. And the other side of it is a lot of this is based around the whole process of public interest, and the jury represents the public. Mm -hmm. How do we square those two things up, or how would you square those two things up? Because I, I, I am, I am, I, right now at the moment, from the evidence I've heard, I am sort of quite. I, I can't square this one in my, my own view. I would say that it's not so much about capacity. Uh, it's not about the capacity or whether or not the jury is well equipped to deal with complicated measures, uh, meaning it was a thing. Um, what this really comes down to is the efficient management of places. Uh, and when you have jury trials in place, we have a presumption of jury trial matters of fact which would otherwise be able to be resolved very quickly are, are left to the end of the process. And what that does is it creates uncertainty. Uh, it also stretches out proceedings in a way which drives that cost. And I mean, I can give a bit more details about how this worked in, in, in the UK. I just said, can I just say very quickly on a technical issue? I'm hearing quite a lot of echo. I'm not sure what's the, if that can be addressed. Uh Perhaps uh, if you switch off your camera, uh, sometimes we do have some problems. Uh, we are getting the signs a wee bit ropey, um, okay. so try yeah. that. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. We'll see. Okay, I'll try again. I'm still getting that echo, but I'll try, I'll try and ignore it. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, we'll see how... Yeah, we'll see how that goes. I, I will go on. I was going to say on this point here that... Um, a few years ago in England, the Queen's Bench Division of the High Court introduced reforms to push for early determination. And that in practice meant deciding on the central issue of defamatory meaning at a much earlier stage. What we've actually seen from this, and I think this is an important thing to, to note, is we've actually seen an increase in defamation cases after those reforms. It suggests that it's that, that, that the Defamation Act of 2013 in some way has contributed to a more general uh, making defamation laws more accessible in a way which is advantageous not just to the defendant but to the claimant. Um, and that's because expedited proceedings, or streamlined proceedings, which is what the Queen's Bench Division in, in England uh, ha has introduced, is something that is only possible if you remove that presumption, the presumption of jury trials. Because otherwise, questions of meaning as well as questions of serious harm, but questions of meaning have to then be left to the end of proceeding, which means that possibility that cases are disposed of in this quick manner once issues which are really fundamental to the claim are resolved by the judge is no longer a possibility. So, I mean, that's what I just say about juries. Uh, the one other provision I'd like to make reference to before I open up questions is clause four, which is the public interest test. And I think this is important because I think it's an example both of the conservatism of the Defamation Act and of its importance. Um, you broadly, I'd say it, it's a core principle of democracy that everyone should be able to participate freely and without fear on discussions of public interest. Um, this is why the European Court of Human Rights has identified a positive obligation on states to create a, quote, favorable environment for participation in public debate. The reality is that the current law does not create such an environment. And the Defamation Act 2013 did go some way into ensuring that environment is there. Mark Hanna um, testified to the fact that the Reynolds defense is essentially never used in Northern Ireland. I don't know uh, uh, much about that, but what I can say is the same was certainly true in England for 2013, um, it, it, with most publishers preferring to settle rather than to face the uncertainty of the defense. In 2011, Lord Spain said that due to this uncertainty, Reynolds would, and I quote, continue to complicate the task of journalists and editors who wish to explore matters of public interest and will continue to erode freedom of expression. The Human Rights Committee, uh, Joint Committee of Parliament, therefore recommended that the 10 point criteria, 10 point list of criteria uh, you find in Reynolds, be replaced with a clear and, un and unambiguous defense of public interest. That's what Clause 4 does here. It is important to emphasize, though, that 
just because the words responsible journalism don't appear in the text of section four, this doesn't leave the door open for irresponsible journalism. Section four requires a defendant to show that he or she reasonably believed that publishing the statement was in the public interest. In practice, the courts in England require compliance with ethical standards of journalism in order to be able to meet this test. Uh, it, and you are still there. I, I think I'm yes, out. I think maybe the here. echo's gone. Yep. That's great. I think we've, we're, we, 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 we've, uh, we've fixed it. Um, thank you. So I was just going to say, in practice, courts in England do require ethical compliance in order to meet this test of reasonable belief. The courts examine... Uh, the what the journalist believed, uh, whether the journalist believed what they said, whether it was based on a reasonable and responsible investigation, and whether it was a reasonable belief to hold. So the public interest test therefore incentivizes responsible journalism without the need for the confusing 10-point test that you found with Reynolds. I should note, circling back to my first point, that Section 4 is, is also not just reserved for journalists. I mean, the, the, the Reynolds defense was often misleading in, in, in its reference to responsible journalism. And it's therefore far better equipped to protect public interest speech in the age of the internet. There's um, obviously a lot more to be said, but I'm going to end on that point because I think it, it's important to underscore the broader need for harmonization. Uh, we've, we've heard about how courts um, have interpreted reasonable belief, how they've streamlined hearings to allow for early resolution, and how the serious harm test has been developed over the last eight years. None of this is radical. Indeed, in one recent Supreme Court case, Lord Sumption explicitly said that he did not see the Defamation Act as representing a revolution in the law of defamation. What it did do was to clarify, codify, and advance developments in the law which have proven invaluable in restoring some balance to our defamation law. Um, as has been said before in the committee, harmonizing the law now will bring with it eight years of benefits in the form of case law, eight years in which the courts have further clarified and streamlined the procedures and the tests that were introduced in the Defamation Act of 2013. So I'll end there, but I, I very much look forward to, to your questions. Okay, um, this, is, this is actually uh, to both of you. Um, in Clause 11, which is a trial to be without jury, should that be amended in order to reflect the findings of the 2017 Gillen Review of Social Justice, which suggested that judges should have discretionary powers to compel parties to undertake alternative dispute resolution or face fina possible financial penalties? Because as we're saying, we're quite happy, or I'm not trying to paraphrase what you're saying, but if we take juries out of the equation and you're giving the power to the judge, should the judges then be in a position to have the discretionary powers to compel parties to uh, undertake a, a certain alternative dispute resolution? Uh, I'd be happy to go first on that, and, and, and yeah. I can pass it to Jeff Um I would say I'm, I, I, I'm not so sure about the Gillen Review, and I'm not so sure about whether or not amending uh, Clause 11 is the right way to do this. But what I would say is that encouraging the use of ADR is indeed really important. There have been other suggestions about the way that is done. And again, I'm operating in an English context, so I'd have to, uh, ask, you'd have to forgive me for the fact that I'm operating from some position of ignorance when it comes to Northern Ireland. But certainly, for example, in England, there has been some talk about amending practice directions. Those guidance issued by judges is to the appropriate interpretation of civil procedural rules. I think that in those cases, having some sort of sanctions in place where uh, at the very least, where claimants have unreasonably not engaged in uh, ADR, I think is very appropriate. I mean, again, it's looking at all mechanisms that are available to be able to reduce costs and in order to be able to make the system as, as, as inacceptable as possible. Where you have claimants who deliberately avoid the use of ADR, that's a good indication that the claim is abusive, i.e. that its real intent is to drive up costs and to harass the, 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 the target. And I think uh, having sanctions in place for that would certainly be appropriate. But I, I, I'm afraid I'm, I, I'm not in a position to say how exactly that could be done in relation to the Gillen Review. Okay, your timing is perfect, Matthew. You're on now. Okay, thank you. Thank you both for your um, evidence. Um, uh, obviously, this bill um, largely uh, transposes the 2013 Defamation Act from England and Wales into Northern Ireland. Could you say a bit more about the specific um, uh, added 
um, protections that you feel the 2013 Act has given to um, journalists and writers generally? Yeah, sure. Charlie, do you want to take that one or should I? Uh, to either of you, really, it's, it's either or both. I, I'm happy to go after you, Jessica. I, I, I can. Uh... Um, sure. I mean, so, um, uh, and I think Charlie can elaborate on this as, as a lawyer, but I think, I mean, the as has been mentioned, like the public interest defence has never been available to journalists in Northern Ireland. And I think this is a really important one that will give um, added um, added uh, protections to journalists. I mean, I know um, that when Paul Tweed was here some weeks ago, he said that the truth is the biggest sort of defence that any journalist can have. But I think this is, this is very, very difficult uh, when it comes to actually using a truth defence because it assumes sometimes that there's one kind of objective objective tr truth that everyone agrees on and and that's uh, it's just not that simple and it's just not that, that easy so i think these added defenses so the you know the the defam in the defamation act there's obviously the truth's defense as well there's honest opinion and there's public interest um and i think these are really important to to you know ensuring that journalists can have um confidence you know to 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 go forward and to defend themselves in court and to hopefully um reduce the amount of settlements that that we've that we're seeing at the moment okay thanks do you have anything to add to that Charlie? yeah i'll just say one thing i i i, I think the the reference to um I, I think another thing that paul tweedy and i think others have said is that a lot of the talk here has been about the chilling effect and that uh, the response to that was that this does nothing to address the problem of legal intimidation. That's something I would push back on. I, I think that pre-Defamation Act 2013, there was a lot of uncertainty about the law. So there was case law existing, which provided a public interest defense in terms of Reynolds. Uh, there was a, you know, a, a, a substantial harm threshold in, in the case of Jamil. There was other case law which provided these mechanisms that you see in the Defamation Act. But there was a crucial lack of certainty about their application. And you didn't have that accessibility. So I think to some extent what the Defamation Act did was to embolden um, those who are on the receiving end of some of these spurious legal threats, some of these more aggressive legal threats. In, in knowing that there were defenses, there were there were mechanisms in place to protect them uh, if they were pursuing um, responsible journalism in compliance with ethical standards. So I think that's one thing that's been really important. And I mean, one thing that we have seen it, it, just anecdotally in terms of our conversations with those people who are impacted, you know, I don't think either me or Jessica want to suggest that, that would want to suggest, given that we're both working on, on in the issue of slaps now, that the law is perfect, that, they're, that that's they're, you, you don't still get a huge amount of abuse of libel law from the, 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 the mega wealthy against those people who can't afford to mount a defense. But it's certainly harder to credibly put together a letter and intimidate someone on the basis of a frivolous claim. And I think I would emphasize that word frivolous in the sense that the serious harm, harm clause in particular is important in filtering out those claims, both in relation to preliminary hearings and, and preemptively. I think it's easier to call the bluff in some of these cases, knowing that a court will not accept cases which do not reach a certain threshold. Yes, yeah, so, so the, the point you're making is that if we accept that legal intimidation, there, that, that, that is a practice, I think it's I think there's pretty enormous um, anecdotal evidence that that is happening in Northern Ireland. Uh, Mr. Tweed, it sounded like from what he was saying that he participates in it effectively. That's what he does for a living. He didn't. He wasn't, uh, though. He, uh, you know, he alleged the trusty sword of truth was was the best defence. It sounded like he was a an enthusiastic deployer of uh, legal intimidation in the way he described what he did to me. Um, uh, but it's harder to do that. Is what, is what you're saying that it's harder to do that if the person on the receiving end of said legal intimidation from a, 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 a another uh, lawyer um, uh, is um, uh, if you have a greater clarity over um, your own over what the, over how the court will interpret the law is that is that what you have I I've put it in a very long-winded way. No, that's absolutely right. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to highlight the public interest test is I think it's a really good example of that. I mean, if you were to say, 
you know, that I was exercising my rights as a responsible journalist. That obviously begs the question, what is a responsible journalist? So someone will then say, well, just look to the case of Reynolds. And you'd look to the case of Reynolds and you'll get a 10 point list of criteria. And you have no real idea whether or not the, the judge in question, you know, whether or not they're going to attach more significance to one or rather the other. In some cases we know of prior to the Defamation Act of 2013, you would get lawyers representing or misrepresenting the Reynolds test as essentially being a 10, 10, 10 point checklist. You'd have to tick all the boxes. And that was quite easy to do because there was this uncertainty. And what you have in the Defamation Act of 2013 is this positive affirmation uh, of, 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 of the need for public interest journalism uh, or other public interest speech more generally. And, and you're replacing that concept of responsible journalism with this concept of reasonable belief. Uh, and, and reasonable belief then is something which, if you have had that thorough investigation, is something which you can, you can be more confident is something that is going to be recognized in court. Okay. Can I ask, um, uh, this might be one for you, Jessica, in relation to um, the context, as I mentioned earlier on my um, chairmanship of the relevant all-party group, but um, obviously this place is uh, commonly thought to be, has a particularly distinct challenge around press safety. Um, do you think that, uh, the, that there is a, um, uh, from the perspective of an individual journalist, would you say that the sort of, if we accept that, or if we accept the argument that the defamation law here is currently um, litigant friendly, um, is there any link between, in terms of the how difficult it is to be a journalist here, is there a link between stress around press safety and also stress around the um, the you know the how overwhelmingly pressurised defamation law can be? Is there a link, or is that spurious? No, I think there is a link. I think, I think, I mean, the safety of journalists issue is also contributing to a chilling effect. Yeah. Um, so, like, Northern, journalists in Northern Ireland are in a, in a re, like, they're op are operating, I think it's fair to say, in a, in a really tight space mm -hmm. um, compared to their colleagues, um, certainly in the rest of the United Kingdom, and, but also down south, I think, because of those safety of journalists issues. And I think, um, as well, I don't think it's a stretch to say that you know, when, when you have verbal attacks and physical attacks on journalists, it it, um, it becomes, I suppose, more, um, it kind of contributes to an environment in which it's more acceptable maybe as well than to, you know, journalists becomes a vi become a viable target in general in, yeah. in terms of then also a lawsuit. I mean, we've, we've um, Donald Trump is, uh, as Charlie mentioned, um, English Pen and Index and Censorship are also doing uh, a lot of work on um, this legal phenomenon, which you might have come across. I think um, Dr. Andrew Scott mentioned it when he was here, strategic lawsuits against public participation, yeah. um, these slaps, as they're called. And um, uh, Donald Trump was a huge proponent of slaps. And I mean, his anti-media rhetoric as well, you know, went alongside that. So I think, I think they are all uh, media freedom issues and, you know, they're not... Uh, you know, they they are linked in, in some way. Okay, thank you. Thankfully, I don't think Donald Trump has ever litigated in Northern Ireland, though he may be watching the Finance Committee today, so mm. perhaps he'll get the, hopefully he hasn't got the idea. We get he'll people from all over watching the Finance Committee. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Maybe on Fox News tonight. And Hello. Hello, I'm Alicia. Yep, go ahead. Yeah. From our good chair, I was a five year old for leg. You are both very welcome here today. Uh, funny, I've heard the expression before about being uh, the Wild West, but it wasn't in relation to litigation that was described in the island of Ireland with a, um, a tap dancer or, or, or a step dancer on top of a telephone box. Um, and as I say, at that time, uh, it wasn't litigation they were discussing, but it was at the All Ireland flat. <laughs> but in that definition in itself, it sort of was implying like that uh, without doubt that our law needs to be reformed in many ways. But within that, there's still uh, essential ingredients. Now, just uh, I, I do accept that most journalists and that are responsible and they seek to report the truth. But you know, at the end of the day, too, that uh, we do have some journalists that sometimes report lies or even act with malice, mm. uh, and that um, only last week we had evidence given that we're so keen, like maybe to tell a a white lie. 
uh, as long as one is uh, defending the freedom of speech. So uh, do you really think that uh, the freedom of speech in itself sort of trumps all else? I can... Um, Both on that. I, I could just respond to that first, if it would be helpful. Um, so I think there is a, a distinction to be made here between, and I think someone's already made it before in this committee, so apologies for, for the repetition, but I think there's a distinction to be made between you, what is moral and what is ethical. Um, we talk about lying being bad, and lying is bad, and I certainly don't want to suggest that I'm condoning anyone telling lies. But I think it's also worth taking, uh, focusing on, on what it is that defamation laws are supposed to do. Defamation laws are not meant to stamp out the phenomenon of lies. So they're not meant to prevent people from ever misrepresenting or misstating the truth. That's not what defamation laws are there for. Defamation laws are there where, in order to protect people, individuals, from reputational harm. So I think that's important to emphasize because if there is no harm, then there shouldn't be an actionable claim. And this is why I think clause one is important because it's right to filter out claims where you don't have, uh, where, where the individual involved has not been harmed. Because then when you are balancing out these two conflicting rights, on the one hand, uh, the right of the, say, journalist to for their, their right to free speech, and on the other hand, the right of the individual's reputation, then I think that balancing act becomes you know, quite clearly then falls on the side of the journalist where the individual who's been targeted hasn't been harmed. So I think I would, I would push back and I say I would think that's quite appropriate in the context of, of defamation. More broadly on your answer, yeah, there are other lies, there were, sorry, there are other laws which will address problems caused by, by, by misinformation, by lies. But in the context of defamation, I think it's important to make that point that the purpose is not simply to stamp out all lies and all misrepresentations. Well, just again, too, you've alluded to uh, that other problem that, uh, is, that keeps arising, i.e. the definition of serious harm in itself. And you would accept that for serious harm to one person may not be serious harm to another. Uh, and yet, now, what will happen sort of as like a judge will decide if the harm is serious or not, and the person who has been defamed will be told that their experience doesn't count. Is that, is that a fair comment? Apologies, I was just trying to uh, unmute that. Um, I think it's worth looking at what the serious the harm threshold actually does here, uh, because it again I made this point earlier. I think that quote I made where I said that from from Lord Sumption that this they did not see this as representing a revolutionary change in in defamation law was in the context of the harm test. Uh, what the what what section one of the Defamation Act does. It essentially puts an end to the, to the practice whereby words themselves, the meaning of words themselves, could be used okay. to infer harm. So now you actually have to show, you have to actually have to show that harm has been caused. You actually have to show, as a matter of fact, that harm has been caused. And again, I think that's important because I think we are now beyond a stage. I think it's a pretty outdated view that you, have, you know, it can be quite an outdated practice whereby we, we see individual words as always universally uh, uh, imputing, uh, causing harm, regardless of the circumstances. So I think what's mu a much more appropriate way of doing this is to look at the, the individual harm, the actual harm that was caused to the individual, as opposed to looking at the meaning of the words alone. And that's what the Defamation Act does. Uh, and just a question to Jessica that, uh... Does she think that um, quite possibly here in the north of Ireland that we're likely to become uh, not just the Wild West, but uh, maybe the litigation capital uh, in the event of, uh, uh, the, uh, of the new law not being introduced? I had maybe a little bit of difficulty hearing the last part of your question, but as I understood, it basically... Uh, referred to libel tourism, is that right? That's it. Or will yeah. we become yeah. the global capital of libel tourism? No. Can we fill our five-star hotels with lots of highly expensive lawyers? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I think that was a fear, uh, certainly, when Northern Ireland was left behind in 2013 because of the fact that uh, that 
the rest of the UK that, or, or specifically London, I suppose, was such a libel tourism uh, hub, and that they were, you know, adopting this new, new legislation that was um, that was designed to, to stamp that out. And then, you know, in turn, Northern Ireland wasn't adopting that new legislation. So there was a fear that, that the libel tourism could be redirected here. Um, obviously, that hasn't come to pass. Um, libel tourism is not an issue in Northern Ireland. Um, but um, you know, as, as I think we've discussed, there's lots and lots of reasons why this uh, Defamation Act should be adopted, or this Defamation Bill should be adopted. Um, and uh, so, you know, libel tourism, you know, isn't. I don't think it's it's probably the most. Uh, relevant maybe in our discussion just for here. clarity and for the record because we've heard differing views on libel tourism as we come through but as far as you're concerned you know we have not become the capital of libel tourism since the 2013 act has come in no and and i suppose just to maybe clarify as well what we mean by libel tourism i mean it isn't it are um are uh, people elsewhere in the uk i mean we've heard of people elsewhere in, in the uk being threatened with defamation law in northern ireland I mean, if, if you're maybe referring to libel tourism in that sense, you know, using other threatening defamation law in, in other jurisdictions, well, yes, I mean, Northern Ireland does seem to be a problem. Again, it's difficult uh, to get people to come on the record necessarily and speak about that and, and to point to specific cases. I guess open democracy is one because they're not based here in Northern Ireland. Um, <clears throat> But are we hearing of journalists who are, you know, um, based in, in the United States or in, I don't know, in the Middle East being threatened with lawsuits in Northern Ireland? Um, no. I don't think so. so. Okay. okay, thank you. That's grand, Jessica. Gormagot. Uh, Gormagot, Chair, that's me. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Militia. And, sort of, uh, I think no other indications there were. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, Charlie. Thank you very much indeed, Jessica. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. And... Uh, uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. It was a very interesting evidence session. Thank you very you much. Did. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, if we move on to the next item of our agenda, it's oral evidence from uh, Peter Gervin. Uh, the committee will now receive oral evidence from Peter Gervin on the defamation bill. The session we reported by Hansard. And have we got Peter on Starley? Uh, hopefully, hopefully so. Can you hear me? Uh, more importantly, yes, I can, Peter. Can you hear us loud and clear? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, Thanks very much, indeed. Uh, just, just to sort of brief the team, a sort of uh, briefing notice at page 154. Uh, written submission from Peter is at page 161. Uh, Peter, you're sort of more than welcome to the committee. I'm just going to invite you to uh, speak to your submission on the committee stage of the defamation bill. If you could take around about 10 minutes or so telling us about the bill, what you like or dislike about it, and how you might want to see it amended. And uh, over to you, Peter. Off you go. Thank you. Um, so, first of all, um, thank you to the committee for the opportunity to attend. Um, secondly, um, it's just important to make clear that uh, I'm attending in my own capacity as opposed to in the capacity or representative of the Bar Council. So, my views are my own. Um, in broad terms, it seems to me that the draft bill. Um, one does not meet the stated policy objective to make it easier and less expensive to take legal action when you've been defamed, and two is skewed um, too heavily in favour of publishers and in particular uh, website publishers or operators. Um, taking the first issue and making it easier and less expensive to take legal action for defamation, as I understand it, Dr. Scott had. had a, had addressed or identified this as a core issue um, prior to the reforms, where he made clear that litigants can't afford to defend or vindicate their reputations. As the committee's already alluded to today, the position in this jurisdiction is that legally it is not available for defamation actions. Um, the reality about this draft legislation is that it doesn't do anything to address this issue. Uh, and in fact, by imposing a new legislative scheme which raises, raises threshold conditions, um, that will have a chilling effect on any potential defamation claim or plaintiff, um, whatever their level of funding. Um, it, it's also, uh, I think, important to note the, that the additional protections on top that are offered to website operators and social media sites um, has a particular res resonance for, if you like, normal people or not spectacularly rich people, um, because this is the medium through which they are most likely to be defamed uh, and seek relief. Um, there was some reference earlier to the availability of um, some sort of acknowledgement 
via the IPSO mechanisms, and there were some anecdotes provided about alternative um, mechanisms available to people, but but none of those really um, operate on, on a level which, which compensates uh, the individual concern or rights the wrong. And in fact, subject to the committee checking, I mean, certainly up until fairly recently, a number of our uh, media outlets were not, as I understand it, signed up to the IPSO code. They may well have subsequently joined it, but... Um, so the, the next issue then is um, the fact that it seems to me that the legislation is skewed too heavily in favour of publishers or the defendant generally. Um, so as has already been acknowledged, the statute or the bill cuts and pastes in large measure the English provisions. Um, there isn't actually much to suggest that the 2013 Act reduced complexity in this area of the law, and in fact it's already been acknowledged by some of the participants earlier that there was a series of cases that had to establish what all these new things meant, which meant that the first litigants uh, experienced the increased risk and cost of having to establish what the law is and means. Um, the adoption of a serious harm test, uh, similar to England, seems to me to significantly increase costs at an early stage of litigation, particularly if it's to be brought in here um, by an amendment to the rules to allow claims to be struck out pursuant to serious harm being a threshold. Um, it seems to me, in my experience, that the common law provisions uh, or uh, authorities already established a mechanism to get rid of trivial claims. Mm -hmm. And the county court uh, has a jurisdiction at the minute of £3,000, I think, uh, for defamation claims. So smaller claims can already proceed in that arena um, at a low cost and at a fixed cost for both plaintiffs and defendant. It seems to me that actually cost allocation or fixing costs or scaling costs may, may be a different avenue to pursue in relation to um, trying to address some of the concerns that are raised by legitimate investigative journalists, um, as opposed to people that publish defamations that aren't uh, serious investigative journalists. Um, th there's another issue that skews in favour of defendants and publishers, which is the adoption and, um, of a single publication rule. Um, as has already been, I think, acknowledged, um, the, 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 what's that, what that's aimed at is to prevent a plaintiff deciding to sue on re repeated libels um, by the same defendant, um, which seems to me to rather ignore two things. One, you may get to a stage which, if you like, breaks the camel's back where you're repeatedly defamed in the same way. Um, not everyone rushes into court the first time. The second is um, that it seems to me that in this jurisdiction, um, there's a particular feature of our tabloid press that they repeat the same libels multiple times um, as a theme um, every usually four to eight weeks or something like that, that they give a nickname to someone, they get a story, and then on pretty thin grounds, they rerun the same story with the same nickname and the same libel. Um, so that's, if you like, in relation to publishers generally, um, of particular concern to me um, is, the, is the then even more heavily skewed provisions in favour of website operators, so-called. Um, the bill uh, was, is obviously going to be welcomed by traditional media organisations and free speech groups, as has been pretty clear from the evidence that I've listened in on. Um, but it, it would be it would represent a red letter day for website operators and big tech companies who host social media platforms. Th this is because they benefit too from the protections that I've just provided that apply to every publisher. And then by combination of clauses five, nine, and 10, in my view, this makes it almost impossible or certainly very, very difficult to advise anyone to bring a defamation proceeding against uh, a website operator or social media site, um, particularly if the operator chooses um, to locate itself um, for, for the purposes of its terms and conditions and avoiding liability outside of the UK or the EU, most notably in the United States. Um, 
I do know that the proposer of the bill had to seek the permission of the Secretary of State to include provisions relating to website operators within the bill, uh, according to the debates that I've read. The bill itself um, seems to me to cut and paste from the 2013 Act, meaning that it grounds itself in an understanding of the internet that is at least eight years old. Um, this is seriously outdated um, and does not respond to the zeitgeist of the uh, memorandum, which is that defamation laws here predate the invention of the internet, so that there's a compelling case for review. If that's right, well then one would need to look at the internet or our understanding of it as it is today, rather than cutting and pasting an English provision from 2013. Um, to my knowledge, there's been no repeated, reported case of a direct claim, um, or certainly one that's got very far off the ground, against a large tech company or website operator for defamation in England. This is either because technology companies do not publish defamatory content, or that they're virtually impossible to sue, now, given the former clearly cannot be correct, even on the terms of the proposer of the bill, the latter must be the position. The proposer of the bill said, if we're looking for a medium where reputations are trashed, not on a daily, hourly, or even minute by minute basis, but on a second by second basis, it's on the World Wide Web and on social media sites. But yet, the bill um, seeks to put in place further protections for these companies, who, unlike some of the examples given of journalists and so forth earlier, have vast resources, have algorithms which control content and derive huge huge profit, including from defamatory content. Um, as anyone who's been a victim of defamation online can attest to, large tech companies already put up every conceivable roadblock to the enforcement of reputational rights within their armory, especially with regard to anonymous or troll accounts. These include providing, providing deficient and ineffective online notification tools, especially with regard to libel claims, requiring court orders to provide information on the account holder, which often turn up information of no utility, seeking to provide uh, Sisyphean requirements upon a notice or correspondence providing uh, notification of a claim, disputing jurisdiction and arguing that the defamatory meaning as set out in the initial correspondence must precisely align with the meaning that's later determined by the court. The new provisions in the bill provide an even greater scope for these companies to avoid liability, which is one of the few checks on the operation of these platforms. Um, much of this seems to me to be prefaced on the stated objective to, quote, provide increased protection to operators of websites that host user-generated content. Um, for the reasons already stated, I don't agree with this objective, which seems to me to run against everything we've learned about these so-called intermediaries in the last 10 years. I heard reference earlier on to the online safety bill that seems to be making its way through the UK Parliament. It seems to me that the policy objectives underlying that bill flatly contradict those underlying this bill. Um, certainly, to my mind, this bill does not meet the objective of taking better account of the impact of the internet. Clause 5 is of particular concern. Subsection 2 provides uh, a pretty unspecific or ill-defined defence. Um, the process of notification or notice being provided to website operators or social media companies is not straightforward. Um, in my experience of making claims, whether in libel data or on other grounds. The other troubling matter about this provision is that subsection 6 makes reference to regulations that are not before the committee um, or the plan to be before the assembly, but rather derogated in some way to the department to make. It's not clear to me why regulations are not proposed alongside the Act so that we could know how such a claim is to be made against internet operators. If it's simply a cut and paste of the English model, presumably the intentions for the department to adopt the same regulations that have been so ineffective there. It's also unclear why this extremely important issue is to be delegated to the department at all. Um, it, then one moves on to the method of contacting and what, what it is that is meant to be provided. Again, I note that the proposer of the bill stated when proposing the bill that somehow subsection 6 is, is meant to lead to the claimant needing to know the name and a way of contacting the person who has defamed them. 
There's nothing that I can see in this draft bill that refers to what the information is or a way of contacting the person. <laughs> Clauses or subsections seven and eight um, seem to me to be fairly meaningless without the actual regulations in your hand. Um, and also raise the question about whether the clause of the whole is, is going to be operable pending regulations. Um, subsection 11 is particularly concerning because it provides a defence to anyone. Um, sorry, <laughs> subsection 11 is concerning because it, it requires malice to be proven, which is impossible to test to, to satisfy in reality. Subsection 12 is of particular concern because it makes clear that the fact that someone moderates content um, doesn't open them up to liability. I ask why should be that, that be the case if a complaint is made via the usually deficient online moderation function and rejected, why is it that the operator should be able to avoid liability for its own act of moderation? Clause 9 then deals with <coughs> supposed libel tourism, a problem which is acknowledged by the proposer of the bill not to exist in Northern Ireland and by previous participants in this afternoon's session. Set session. <coughs> it seems to achieve to me is yet further protection for internet intermediaries who choose to base themselves outside of the UK and the EU, which can be a paper exercise by simply inserting into your terms and conditions that that's where you're based. The, examples get, the example given in the preamble or by the proposer was that um, if a statement was published 100,000 times in Australia and only 5,000 times in Northern Ireland, that would be a good basis to conclude the most appropriate jurisdiction was Australia. Um, this seems to me to suggest that there is then an increased threshold way beyond substantial harm for these defendants that choose to locate outside the EU. It involves an uncalibrated numbers game, which no plaintiff could be sure of in advance disclosure by the South Sea defendant that they're proposing to sue. Um, obviously, no one would proceed to sue any defendant domiciled outside the EU in these circumstances, or very few would. Um, it seems to me that this is particularly absurd as a provision, um, especially again given the proposer's reference to the fact that it's meant to build in a common sense approach. It doesn't seem to be common sense to me, and not nowhere in the provision does it refer to common sense. Um, clause 10 is yet another hurdle to sue uh, social media or tech companies or website operators. Under this provision, you can't even sue them unless it's not reasonably practicable to sue the primary publisher. Um, there are myriad problems with this provision, in my view. One, what does reasonably practicable mean? Two, what if the primary publisher is entirely impecunious and has no fear of damages? Three, what account is taken of providing of, of the platforms themselves providing um, the platform for mass publication? And for um, what, if any, impact does this have uh, on the already la loose rules around registering and operating accounts online? Wh whereas the terms and conditions of the tech companies specifically allow people to register anonymously. Um, I, I do have views on other parts of the act. Um, perhaps not terribly strong views on the statutory defences and on the uh, abolition of the presumption in favour of jury trial. And I'm happy to address the committee if they feel that that's helpful. But otherwise, but that's my opening submission. Okay, thanks, Peter. Peter, sort of the last bit, sir, we're talking about Clause 11, about the, the jury trial issue. Could you just uh, elucidate a bit more of that, please? Well, I mean, I, I don't have a particularly strong view either way. I can see pros and cons of judge alone and jury or, or reversing the presumption in favour of judge alone. Um, I mean, there's this kind of notion of it that somehow juries will give spectacularly high damages um, and swallow plaintiff's cases easier than defendants. I'm not sure that that's borne out in practice. Um, I, I don't also particularly agree with some of the remarks that were made earlier about how this all adds some terrible un uncertainty into the litigation process that doesn't exist in all litigation. Um, that said, a reasoned judgment from a judge um, can itself vindicate someone's reputation as much as a, as a jury award. 
Um, jury awards are constrained uh, and can be appealed anyway if they're excessive. Um, so, I mean, I can certainly see pros and cons. I'm not, I'm not uh, it, you know, if you were going to ask me as a preference, I would probably wish to retain the jury system, but I can see arguments either way. And I don't think it would make a huge difference in practice. I mean, the, the reality is that the other provisions of the draft bill would preclude an already small group of plaintiffs even bringing proceedings anyway. So, um, and uh, as I say, sorry, and the other one, sir, Peter, sort of the uh, questions about sort of what's your views on alternative dispute resolution? Um, well, uh, generally, um, I think for all litigation, not just defamation litigation, um, it's a move in the right direction. I mean, there's already provisions within various protocols that encourage alternative dispute resolution and that the court could take account of rejections um, of that. I think in the Republic of Ireland, there's a statute which requires parties um, in a more you know, more formal way to consider it. Um, I mean, I should say, sorry, it's a bit off the question, but um, th there was reference earlier uh, to um, to correspondence that was sent by lawyers in advance of even claiming, and th this was somehow turned into um, an admission, I think, by Mr. Tweeds, which I don't recognise that 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 he engages or lawyers engage in intimidation by pre-action correspondence. I mean, that, that, that's just not right. There's a pre-action protocol that was brought in, I can't remember which date, but um, by, by Mr. Justice Gillen whenever he sat in the division, which requires plaintiffs to write pre-action protocol letters that set out their claim. And in fact, if you don't follow that protocol, you're criticized. So uh, I find some of that very difficult to follow. Um, but anyway, uh, Sir, could, the, you just, could you just, yeah. just for the record, could you just sort of state that again? So, actually, uh, uh, Justice Gillen has stated that you know pre-action protocols are something that has to be done. And well, if the, there's, always, it, be... there's already a pre-action protocol for defamation actions in Northern Ireland, which sets out what the requirements are of a plaintiff and a defendant. So you, you have to write to the proposed defendant saying. I'm going to sue you for defamation. This is the meaning I attribute. This is why I say it was bad, et cetera, et cetera. And then they have to respond within 21 days uh, or 28 days. I can't remember which. But I mean, I could certainly send you a copy of that document. But, yes, but the please. notion that somehow engaging in pre action correspondence uh, is to be taken as of and by itself as some sort of lit in intimidation of, of free speech or journalists seems to me to be complete nonsense. In fact, if someone abused pre action correspondence in that way, then they would be heavily penalised by the court. Um, it, it also seems to me that there seems to be a little bit of a tendency to, to descend into, you know, anecdotes about specific cases that are then meant to provide some, you know, grounding principle to proceed upon, which, which I don't recognise either. I, I don't perceive that there's some fast quantity of libel claims in this jurisdiction or people willing to bring them. I mean, there's talk about libel tourism, but why would you sue in Northern Ireland when you can more or less, depending on the publication, obviously, always sue in the Republic of Ireland where the requirement isn't, is, is that, you, that you should establish publication to one person under their 2009 Act? And why would you bring an action in Northern Ireland already when the test's already higher than that? I mean, it, so, so some of it, as I say, just just seems to me to, to sort of intermingle a lot of different issues. Um, another issue that seems to be intermingled is this fair fair point about investigative journalists and free speech. But, but the problem is that the serious harm test isn't just doing away with claims against you know proper investigative journalists who, who to be frank, aren't going to really get the benefit of it. But, if they publish in some sort of national platform anyway. Um, the public interest fence, which I have not much difficulty, achieves that. In fact, what it achieves is that a defendant can publish something that's untrue um, as long as they can stand over their journalistic method. So wh why should someone be afraid of that? I mean, it provides a defense whether the allegations proven to be true or not, as long as the journalist has followed good journalistic practice. So what, why, do you, why does one need these other 
provisions other than that one if you're protecting investigative journalism. Um, I mean, as I say, a lot, a lot of it to me, I mean, I don't have particularly strong views about uh, reforming the way that the defences um, are termed or putting them on a statutory basis. It doesn't seem to me that, that the statutory defences have changed that much from what the common law position was. Um, people do argue a lot in England about whether it's serious harm and invest lots of money at an early stage to argue about that point. Um, and the other thing is it, it kind of ignores the reality of who, who is the most, who, who are going to be the defendants in Northern Ireland, who are going to be the plaintiffs. I, I don't perceive that there's this huge queue of mega rich plaintiffs lining up the Northern Irish courts to sue and libel. Uh, and in fact, most of the defendants seem to me to be well moneyed uh, media organisations usually ultimately under one you know, one company's ownership um, or the BBC that have apparently complained about having to deal with litigation here. But I mean, th there's already a massive imbalance between most plaintiffs and most media defendants. Uh, and what seems to then happen here is that there's reference to, you know, the sort of solo investigative journalist or the public interest, you know, body um, making a publication, and then that's meant to sort of read across to tabloid newspapers or huge media organisations, and I, I, I just didn't follow that logic, to, to be frank. But um, thanks, thanks. you know, I can see, I can see policy reasons behind changing the defences, but um, a lot of it I don't follow. Okay, Peter, thanks for that. Uh, Jim, Jim Minister. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, Peter. Um, thank you for what I find to be very refreshing and informed evidence. I wanted you to, to give the committee the benefit of further exposition on the point relating to the current common law test, which is applicable to what is perceived to be trivial cases. Because a very misinformed component of the advocates of this bill is the contention that this would filter out trivial cases. Um, could you therefore expound for the benefit of the committee the existing common law provisions relating to real and substantial tort and the effective threshold that has to be crossed in that regard before you sustain your case? Yes, certainly. Um, well, well, so, I mean, it's accepted as a broad proposition that the 2013 Act in England it increased or the threshold from what had existed under common law, and that that, that, that was what it sought to achieve. So there's there's three possible options for threshold. Where Northern Ireland sits, the minute is, if you like, in the middle. The Republic of Ireland has a law and a statute which requires publication to one person, which isn't much of a threshold. The English provision has this serious harm threshold, which is very arguable about what it means and it's already gone to the Supreme Court. The, the, the threshold that we apply is based on, on a case called Jamil, but adopted here consistently by the judges. And um, I suppose the best way to explain it is that the court can look at the case in the round, particularly the number of people to whom the allegation was published, the types of people to whom it was published, and the nature of the allegation and how serious it is, and decide whether or not the case is trivial for vexatious or, as it's sometimes put, that the claim isn't worth, or the game, the game isn't worth the candle. In other words, suing for defamation, um, particularly in the High Court suit with all of the costs, um, it isn't to be um, approved by the court in the circumstances of the case. So, so to take an example, um, someone sending an, a, an email to four work colleagues of someone else um, that said something defamatory about them but which they didn't believe when they read um, would would be unlikely to be actionable in Northern Ireland. Um, so the, I mean, it, it's not just a numbers game in terms of circulation, but I mean, there's already a well-established test. The notion that somehow a serious harm test creates certainty um, or more certainty than what that test creates seems to me to be wrong too. Otherwise, why would cases consistently go before the English court, including to the Supreme Court, to argue about what serious harms meant to mean? Um, so there is there is a test there. It's a common law test.
but it is, it is equally certain as the serious harm test. It's just a slightly lower threshold, and it seems to get rid of, in my experience, frivolous and the, the trivial cases that seem to be of concern to people. And for the, let's call them the trivial cases, you also have the safety net of the fact that they can be remitted to the county court. Isn't that correct? So yes. if the defendant wants to make the argument that this case amounts to nothing, it's trivial, they can apply to remit the case to the uh, county court where then it is dealt with in a circumstances where the costs are, are limited and, and specified, is that right? Yes, exactly. There's, there's precise scale, scale costs um, for defamation claims, libel and standard in the county court up to, I think it's 3,000 last time I checked. Um, I mean, another thing is if one's concerned about, you know, exorbitant legal costs for high court claims, I mean, another option, you know, rather than use a hammer to crack a nut with, with adopting an entirely new test for threshold, you could simply increase the county court limit. I mean, the county court limit in other claims is now set at 30,000, yeah. which, which would get rid of a lot of the problem that, that these people are, the, the free speech uh, advocates are, are arguing about. I mean, if you raise the defamation threat, threshold to something like ten or 15,000 in the county court, most of those smaller claims would go there. If they were brought against bloggers or broadcasters or these smaller groups who are likely to have a smaller publication, then they would have the comfort of having fixed costs, um, both for the plaintiff and for themselves. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, I wanted to take you then to Clause 5, which I personally find a troubling clause in terms of the advantage it's now going to give to the greatest offenders, namely social media, the social media platforms. You, you have articulated the obvious problems with that uh, and the fact that you know, a 2013 Act cut and paste it isn't really dealing with the modern uh, social media phenomenon. What do you think is the best way forward uh, to deal with social media in terms of the free for all that they have when it comes to defaming people? Well, I mean, the, the, the rubric that's already in place for all civil claims um, derives from the e-commerce regulations which obviously themselves have been subject to debate, but what, what they require is that in order for a website or intermediary or um, so forth to be liable in damages as opposed to an injunction, is that adequate notice is provided to them of the claim. Um, now, what then happens is these tech companies, which have um, money to, to spend on these things, then argue that the notice provision is this, as I say, sort of Sisyphean task that, you know, even a 30 page letter of claim would be inadequate to give them notice of what the content was. And so there's this attempt by them, if you like, to put these requirements on top. So you have to give the uniform resource locator. You have to say what the words are. You have to say what they could mean. You have to, you have to convey every conceivable legal claim that you may rely on, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I'm not against some sort of rubric for bringing claims against them. The problem with Section 5 is that it starts off from the presumption and on the basis of a policy that they should be immune, which is wrong-headed. And second of all, it, it, it sets the law up on a pretty poor footing if you don't even have these regulations to hand. I mean, it's one thing to cut and paste the 2013 Act. Um, which at that stage didn't have the English regulations, which as far as I can see, have been a bit of a disaster anyway. But if you're going to cut and paste the Act eight years later, when you already know what the regulations were adopted off the back of it in England, but not actually look at the regulation, that, that seems to me to be wrong-headed too. I mean, this seems to me to be... In 2013, it may not have been a massive issue that people were thinking about, or certainly at that stage, um, the tech companies have been very good at convincing the world that they were really this sort of middleman that had no interest or involvement or editorial function in relation to content. I mean, that whole notion is sort of, you know, dissipated now. Everyone realizes that, that they have a significant amount 
at stake here and that they actually promote content that's controversial and defamatory and make money from it. So section five seems qualified to me to me, one, to get off on the wrong start because it doesn't start off even from a neutral position. Two, I'm all for having a rubric for how one would bring claims because that would define what needs to be said and what doesn't rather than have some argument later on about it. But without actually having any draft regulations in place, then it seems to me that the, the provision sort of doomed to fail or just be argued about endlessly. So um, the reality about whether it's a defamation claim or quite often these claims are to do with multiple defamations, a form of harassment, if you like, and invasions of privacy all at the same time by targeted pages or trolls. And so it, it seems to me that th these provisions need to be not tailored for some clever lawyer, but rather for a consumer or normal person to be able to, to make their complaint. I mean, I think the committee should maybe take a step back from, from legislating for website operators, so-called, until they can understand what it is that these operators actually offer at the minute. I mean, you, you try to make it, don't engage in rhetoric, but if you try to engage with making a complaint about defamatory content that's on a, big, a, a social network um, via their online moderation function, uh, you'll find that a pretty uh, stretching um, exercise and not one that actually asks the question, um, do you say you've been defamed? Um, usually it's, have you been harassed? Are you being bullied? I mean, the, the simple question for those websites should be on those sort of forms it, under data provisions, not libel, is do you consent to your data being processed? Answer no. Result, it should be taken down. And all this legislation seems to do is perpetrate these sort of um, buttress defenses for the companies that control most of what, what is published at the minute and what we see. It seems to me to be um, concerning. And maybe therefore it's no concern, it's no surprise that the evidence we've heard in support of this bill has almost exclusively come from potential defendants. Yes, and I'm pretty sure all of them have said it's a, it's a very good idea. Um, I mean, the, 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 submission, the submission earlier made by uh, the NUJ was quite interesting about why they support website immunity. And that was based on the fact that, for example, a tabloid website that prints content also allows people to comment. And therefore, they might be able to avail of this defense if someone adds in some snipey defamatory comment below their own article because they don't want to moderate their own page, but they want to encourage people to comment on it. I mean, that's pretty extraordinary. They weren't really saying anything about protecting the, the investigative journalist. They were just saying, oh, well, you know, we wouldn't want like the Sun or the Mail Online to be sued for what someone commented below their article because they don't want to be bothered um, moderating it. it. Doesn't seem to me to be a policy objective. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers, thanks. Kate? Thank you, Chair. Um, Peter, I just have one question. You talked earlier there about the single publication rule. So, correct me if I'm wrong, so if somebody publicises something about me, for example, now, that can run and run and run, but this obviously really will change that to one year. But say they put something up about me, uh, the year runs out and they put something again, slight, completely different. The item that's put up more than a year ago cannot be used in the case. So, you, you, you understand what I'm saying? So, they put something up deflammatory over a period of time, and the year runs out on each one until eventually the defamation's gone on that long. You can't stick it any longer. So your solicitor does what he or she should do. Can the previous items be taken into account? Well, I think, I think what you're reading, I'm only really going on what I've read the proposer to be saying about what this rule's meant to engender. I mean, there's obviously a debate as between um, different methods again of, of when you start limitation and limitation to how many publications. But my understanding of what the proposer is saying is that if I was to publish an article saying X murdered someone a year ago and then he doesn't sue me on it um, and then I publish it again um, you know, later but it's substantially the same definition then the defendant could turn around and say well you didn't sue me a year ago when I said it, so you can't sue me now. I mean, 
Again, if that's right, that, that's pretty extraordinary. I mean, people might have all sorts of reasons for not suing someone in libel, not, not, not least the, the cost and uh, other factors that might be in play, for example, criminal investigations and so on and so forth. So th this idea that um, what, what is already a very short limitation period, shorter than, than any other tort of one year, that that then should be closed even further by saying, well, if you defame someone the same way but a year apart and they didn't sue in the first one, well, uh, you can't sue them a year later or a year or a day later. I mean, that doesn't seem to me to be right. And, and, and also, there's going to be this then arguments around, well, is it the same, if you don't use exactly the same words, is it the same publication? Is it the sting? Which is it? But, but again, I come back to, I mean, I, I don't want to get into anecdotes because I don't think it's helpful, but it does seem to me that anyone that picks up one of our tabloid newspapers on a regular basis will notice that they do repetitive stories about the same person, more so than in other tabloids in other jurisdictions. So, I mean, it, as I say, it just seems to me to be a rather troubling provision. I'm not really sure what it's aimed at. I don't see any evidence of there being an abuse of the, the, the publication rule as it stands or the limitation provisions as they stand. So it seems to be me to be answering a problem that doesn't exist. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that, Peter. That's today. all I have. <coughs> okay. Peter, thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for your time. If we have any other follow-up questions, would you mind uh, if, uh, if we get in contact with you and sort of contributing to it? Yes, of course. I'm happy to help. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Chair, is the committee also content to write to the NUJ because we're writing to them anyway? Just ask them about the level of IPSO membership among uh, media organisations in Northern Ireland. Yes, we're great. Good idea. Yeah, and if, if I ask them about um, you know, many complaints, etc., and where that then we'll yeah, we're, we're doing all that. It's just on top of that, it's the IPSO. Yeah, that. Okay. Thanks. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> and so, just for a note from the committee, so we've heard this online safety bill that's been mentioned quite a few times. And there is obviously a lot of issues, particularly to do with sort of clause five. I think as we've gone through the bill and sort of issues to do with that as well. I've asked. Uh, sorry, I apologise because I was whispering to Peter there just to see what we could potentially do about um, getting some more information on the online safety bill. But it's in draft format at the moment. I understand. Chairperson, the committee agreed last week that I would uh, write to the, or you would write to the Secretary of State and to the Minister for the Economy. So my expectation is that this would be reserved. Um, my also understanding is that it is in draft, the online safety bill. So the question is, what's the overlap with the defamation bill? Uh, we haven't got a response yet. We've only just written there. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Okay, Tim, move to the next item on the agenda. Uh, correspondence, correspondence index, 13 items of the correspondence, uh, page 165. First item, the unpaid commercial rents. The committee are asked to consider at page 169 a response from the Minister of Finance advising members that he will not be bringing forward a legislative consent motion to the Assembly on the Westminster Com Commercial Rent Coronavirus Bill. The Minister gives a number of reasons, including that the Westminster provisions or the Westminster proposals will potentially delay payment for a year or more. <coughs> and may provide advantage for multinationals over SMEs. Related appeals may clog up the courts. Existing contract law provides adequate protections. And the issue of unpaid commercial rents in Northern Ireland is not as significant as the rest of the UK. And that a voluntary, media, a voluntary mediation, mediation approach suggested by the Royal Institute of Charters for Bears is to be promoted in the interim. Members, have we any thoughts on this? Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Chair, uh, I must say I didn't find his reasoning very convincing. But maybe it's something we could ask him about next week. Yeah, I think it's probably something to do that, but I think it's also something we might write to the Chambers of Commerce to ask them their their particular yeah. the particular view of that if we're agreed. It, you know, it yeah. it is not. Uh, I know we uh, agreed not to support it, or we uh, we didn't. Uh, the assembly didn't pass accelerated passage for the uh, the coronavirus rates bill, but the argument there seemed to be we had to do it because this was what was happening within sort of uh, 
England and Wales, and this was the process as we were doing yeah. it. Yet here we have something that is a similar sort of logic, but we're deciding we're not doing it. Mm -hmm. So I think I would quite like the minister to explain what the logic is behind the two and why he doesn't see fit to be able to support this. It's actually, uh, again, one of the questions about not bringing forward a legislative consent motion is if there's any penalties that may become of that, particularly when it comes to looking at sort of if there's any financial penalties or any issues that may accrue from that coming forward, where does the where do the potential costs lie? And again, a sort of you know, we have already heard a lot of discussion about where issues to do with super parity are. What are the implications for this? And I'm sorry, I'm quite I just might get a bit, quite a bit more detail on this one. Sorry, Pat. I was just wondering about the 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 um the, the right to pay or the actual ability in order to pay uh, in, in Britain, as it's stated. And I'm just, just what's the difference or what's the mix in the landlord and tenant mix here? Are we saying that there's not as many people in Northern Ireland owe rent? I, I, again, this is, I, I, get, I, I, I find um, there's a lot of, I'm not, th this raises more questions than it answers, I think. Ask the Minister next week and write to the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce. Uh, yes, mm. if we're content. Agreed. Right. Agreed. Okay. Uh, next one is an interesting one. Public Sector Transformation Fund. Members are asked to consider at page 175 correspondence from the Minister of Finance providing a copy of a report on a longitudinal <coughs> study on the Public Sector Transformation Fund, i.e. the Public Sector Voluntary Exit Scheme. The report is lengthy. It indicates that of £700 million available, only around £290 million was spent. This facilitated over uh, 6,600 FTE full-time employee exits, a large number of which were from education, at an overall cost of 42,000 per exit. The exits were mostly from the 15,000 to 45,000 pay range. 27% of the exit employees were over 60, and around 6% were over 65. The age profile and salary profile of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, as we know, is largely unchanged following the voluntary exit scheme, though the number of staff below the age of 29 has re had reduced. It is understood that staffing levels in the Northern Ireland Civil Service are now exceeded those of the pre-voluntary exit scheme le levels, with slightly fewer staff in very junior grades and more staff than before in middle and senior grades. The numbers of agency and temporary staff have also increased. So one way of looking at it, uh, committee, is that we've probably spent around about two hundred and ninety million pounds to be in exactly the same place that we were. That's um, now, I'm not, I'm not trying to be flippant about this, but if we actually look at this, where was the value for money from the voluntary exit scheme that has achieved what? I'm not sure. I think this is a matter of interest to the committee, and I think it's something we need to explore further. But at the moment, are we content to note? But again, uh, maybe one of the questions we will be putting through to the minister next week, and also to uh, uh, bearing in mind the new head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service about civil service reform. I think it's quite important that we ask that question. And what actually did we spend two hundred and ninety million pounds for? Are we agreed. Chair, I think those are all great, good points. Could someone remind me? Did the did the audit office ever do a report? On the voluntary exit scheme, yes, they did. definitely did. Yes, I, I, I couldn't tell you exactly what their findings were um, straight mm. off, but I'll circulate that to the members. Yeah, so well. Okay. okay, thanks. Okay, next, another interesting item. At uh, City Deals, members asked to note at page 284 a response from the Department of Finance to the committee's request for clarity on issues regarding funding and governance of City Deals. Just to remind us, this is where we raised the issue of who was the senior responsible officer and who was the responsible minister for city deals. It appears that although it was agreed that it would be an NIO and Department of Finance SRO, this has not been confirmed and in any event does not extend to accountability for spending. So in one hand we have we were we thought that the NIO and the Department of Finance would be the senior responsible officers, but they're not accountable for the spending. But that hasn't been confirmed. And so what we now think is that this sits with the Department of Policy Responsibility. Oh, sorry, this has not been confirmed in any event, does not extend the accountability for spending. We'll think about it that what you wish. This sits with the Department with Policy Responsibility, who has accountability for spending, 
but does not have the responsibility. The governance of the project, yes. Around the governance of the project. Okay. Anybody see some parallels developing here? The department Being advises. Responsible but not accountable. Uh, yeah. The department advises that any unspent city deals money can be drawn down at a later date. Okay. I, I think I would like to share this response with the committee for the economy so that they can have a look at it. But I also understand it's also the Department for Infrastructure is also involved as well in the Department for Communities. I'd also like to uh, write to the chairs of the Department uh, for the Committee for Infrastructure and Communities as well. Um, I thought there was a relatively simple answer to this issue around city deals and governance and the rest of it. Uh, I think, no, I, to say the least, it's um, less than transparent, and we do need some answers to that as well. Okay, are we agreed? Yep. Agreed. Great. Uh, next item, uh, Public Procurement Common Framework. Members are asked to consider at page 319 correspondence from the Minister of Finance sharing the Public Procurement Common Framework with the Committee. I would consent to consider this at the Procurement Board briefing scheduled for February 2022. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Agreed. Next item is the Banking Forum update. Members are asked to note at page 332 correspondence from the Department of Finance providing an update on the Department's consideration of the Financial Services Union. Suggestion for having a banking forum. Forum. A report on the forum is to follow. Pat, do you want to say anything on that? Um, I, I've sort of run out of time with myself and trying to get information. If you can get any more information out of doing that or having that, that would be great. But I can't. Okay. I, I don't have an opinion on it. I must tell you the truth at this late on where we has are. The, has the All Party Group? You're still the chair of the All Party I'm Group. I'm still the chair of the All Party Group, but. We, we, I just find with, with, with where we are now and with my private members bill, I don't have time really to focus into it, so it might be a better forum here to see if we can get some information out of it. But do we have time even? No, I doubt if we even have time as well. I think, Chair, the Department's indicated they will write to us with a report on the forum. Okay, and it also might be a matter for the Committee for the Economy as well. Yeah. Wait for that, Chair, no? Uh, the other thing is, I would quite like them to make sure that they involve the old party group on sort of banking with that as well. Right. So, are we content to share this response for the committee for the economy? Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, next item is uh, monthly outturn round seven. Members are asked to consider at page three hundred and thirty-eight the monthly spending outturn and the forecast performance for October two thousand and twenty-one. The papers indicate that $91 million is held centrally to cover RHI payments in 2021-22. So the question with the RHI payments is, uh, what is the future of where we're, where, where we're heading with RHI payments? Um, I think I would quite like the sort of assembly research to have a look at that and sort of have a double down a bit more on some of the detail of this as well. But I think it might be worthy of the Department for Finance and maybe info the Department of the Economy just to uh, come back to us and indicate what the £91 million is being held for, what specifically it is, and do they have any proposals for it. And maybe an info to Quiva and the Economy Committee to that as well, just so they're aware of that, if we are agreed. That's it. Thank you. Know, you. Uh, Chair, but uh, one of the questions I would have is, is this £91 million for participants in the RHI scheme, or is this ninety-one million which just under the scheme to go back to the Treasury? That's, well, at the moment, it's Amy. My understanding of it. Um, yeah, that was my understanding too, Chairperson. If the members look at page three four one, it's near the top of the page. Um, it's shown there as Resource Dell. It's called RHI Closure Scheme. And it uh, says Treasury to fund ongoing RHI payments and any potential RHI closure scheme should it occur this financial year. And there's a bit more. So that would appear to be what it is. But uh, we can still ask for further information from the department. And Sorry, indeed, just as a, this financial year? Yep. Should it occur this financial year? So they're trying to close. So they're holding it. So this is the. These, um, the committee had asked about this previous, about centrally held items, yep. which the department hadn't told us about previously. So now they've. they've told us what they've got. So they've got £91 million held centrally, um, provided by uh, HM Treasury. It's been ring-fenced for that purpose, um, with any underspend to be returned to HMT. So um, if they don't spend it by the end of the financial year, it's... Yes, it's back. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yes, further information required. I think uh, do. Thank you very much, indeed. Okay. 
Are we agreed? Ooh, this is the in most interesting piece of correspondence I think we've had in a while. Thank you. Uh, investing uh, activity reports, P362, the Department for Finance, Capital Activity Reports, November 21. Are we content to note? Agreed. Uh, financial transaction capital. Uh, members are asked to consider at page 365 current correspondence from the Department providing further information on financial transactions capital and the reduction in FTC 2225 reflects a Barnett consequential. Is the committee content to write again to the Department seeking information on the actual amounts of FTC paid to the actual projects? It seems a bit disingenuous to come back to us and not actually give the sort of what funding is against which particular projects. Yeah. Are we agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Uh, the Audit Committee members are asked to note at page 368 a copy of a letter from the Audit Committee to the Department of Finance in respect to the 22-25 budgets from the Northern Ireland Audit Office, NIPSO, and the Northern Ireland Assembly Commission. Are we content to note? Note. Noted. Uh, energy Price Crisis. Members are asked to note at page 369 correspondence from the Committee of the Economy to the Department of Finance sinking information in UK government measures to tackle fuel, fuel poverty. Is the Committee content to note? And to note. Mm. Uh, taxation of energy products. Members are asked to note page 370 correspondence from the House of Lords European Affairs Subcommittee on the Protocol to the Financial Secretary of the Treasury regarding a proposed EU directive and the interaction of the Protocol with the Emissions Training Directive. Are we content to note? No, no. Uh, I'd just like to make a sort of comment here. It seems to be that the uh, the House of Lords European Affairs Subcommittee is picking up an awful lot of the sort of um, yeah. protocol detail that is out there, and I don't think it's yeah. getting as wide as um, recognition that it needs. I just think it might be worth if we sent a note to um, the other committees that are particularly involved economy, infrastructure, agriculture, just to ask them to keep a careful eye on what's coming out of the um, House of Lords, uh, uh, House of Lords European Affairs Subcommittee, because it's the only place I've seen where I'm actually seeing all the sort of the, the papers and the briefing notes, both the European side and sort of the UK side as well. Are we content? Mm -hmm. I, I agree, Chair, and I note that in this subject, uh, the committee is having some difficulty getting information. They've now given them a new deadline, the 31st of January. So, yeah. it'll be interesting to keep an eye on this one. Yeah. Uh, next uh, item of the correspondent, uh, defamation e evidence taking. Uh, members are asked to note page 375 correspondence from Mark Hanna. Uh, Dr. Mark Hanna commenting on evidence taken by the committee as part of the committee stage for the definition bill. Is the committee content to note? Well, Chair, I, I would note it with this comment that um, uh, Mr. Hanna should realise that um, he does not have privilege for rash correspondence such as this. It's probably for what he said in the committee, but not for, not for what he says in this letter. I think the committee have noted uh, your yeah. comments, Jim. Sir, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead, Malicia. Uh, I had a comment on the same issue as well. Too. At least he did say that he uh, didn't know why it was that I had to leave the meeting, but uh, I had other priorities at that time. So I do remember in particular that meeting as well, too, that it was prolonged in the meeting uh, at the outset, you know, that where maybe one or two members had totally spent maybe the first hour <laughs> questioning. So if anything, you know, they could bring uh, again to their own attention, like that should be succinct, maybe, and questions that we do ask to ensure like, that uh, every uh, person has an opportunity to um, uh, benefit from raising their own issues. But in that particular meeting, again, to at least, as I say, he did acknowledge the fact that he didn't know why I had to leave the meeting, but it got to that stage that well, I did have to leave the meeting, and I don't I feel I have to apologise for that in any respect. Okay, thanks, Malaysia. Noted. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda, deaf awareness training. Members are asked to note at page 376 correspondence from the committee and member support office providing notice of deaf awareness training for members and party staff on the 17th of December and the 22nd of Hold January. It. Are we content to note? Hold Hold it. It. Uh, composite information request is on page 378. Our, this is an accurate and complete record of the committee's information request. Is this agreed? agreed. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, draft forward work programme is on page 393. 
Members previously agreed to undertake an additional meeting next week in order to conclude committee scrutiny of the non-domestic rates valuation coronavirus bill. The additional meeting is scheduled to include oral evidence from the Institute of Revenue Rates and Valuation, which is the one that N. Snowden said that he talked to. Yep. yep. Okay. I may provide some insight into the administration, uh, the administrative challenge facing LPS. The witness in question is available on Monday afternoon. The committee will also hear a response from the department to the questions raised yesterday. The department has confirmed that officials are available on Monday to do this. Are we therefore content to have an additional meeting on uh, Monday at 14:15? Uh, Great. Agreed, but yes, uh, well, you know, I'm just if we have to go out or, as we did, that's okay. Members may wish to consider delegating their vote. Uh, not yes. that I'm, I'm not expecting any votes, but you know. Yeah, that's good. Good, that's good that's point. Yeah. Uh, also, members are asked to note that the budget bill 2022 and the spring supplementary estimates are come to the committee. In are they likely to come to the committee early rather than in late February 2022? Are members content with the forward work programme? Agreed. Bearing in mind we've got an in camera session just quickly after this as well. Uh, next meeting will be here on the 13th. Of, uh, any other business? Sorry. No. Okay. Uh, the, uh, next meeting on here on Monday, followed by uh, Wednesday. And if we have your agreement, move into closed session. Moving into closed session. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.